Right, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this, the 23rd meeting in 2015 of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee. Can I welcome all members uh, and welcome our witnesses and remind everyone, please, to turn off or at least turn to silent all mobile phones and other electronic devices so they don't interfere with the sound equipment. Uh, item uh, one on the agenda today is a continuation of our evidence taking in relation to our inquiry on work wages and well-being in the Scottish labour market. And I'd like to welcome our first panel of witnesses. Uh, we are joined by Professor Chris Warhurst from University of Warwick and Dr John McGurk, who is head of CIPD at Scotland. So welcome to you both. We're going to allow about an hour uh, for this uh, first uh, panel to cover some of the uh, issues of interest uh, to members, particularly around job quality, fair work, uh, training, trade union involvement, and, and so on. Um, I would ask members if they could keep their questions as short and to the point as possible, and if we can have answers as, as short and to the point, that would be helpful in getting through the topics uh, in the time available. And I would ask members you know, if they would address their questions initially to perhaps one panel member, if you would like to come in and, and, and respond to a point uh, or a question that's been put to, to the other panel member, just catch my eye and I'll, I'll bring you in as, as best I can as, as time allows. I wonder if I could just start, maybe address this initially to Professor Warhurst, um, if I may. Um, I was very interested in reading your um, your submission, uh, talking around issues of job quality, and specifically the the, the issue you identify about the, the two routes an economy can go down, of the, the high uh, road uh, route, which is high skill, high value jobs, uh, as opposed to the low road route route where you're you're competing in terms of uh, 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 pay with uh, other economies and I mean just exploring that just a little bit with you and, and, and finding out where you think we are on that spectrum in relation to the, the Scottish and, and UK economy at the moment and also um, how realistic it is to move entirely towards the the high road assuming that that is your objective. I mean, just to give you an example to put this into context, when the committee was in Paisley uh, last week, um, some of us were speaking to representatives of a, a manufacturing um, business which was involved in, in high volume manufacture, um, very uh, high levels of, of employment, very labour intensive industry. But their competitors were in Eastern Europe and China. And while they uh, strove to be a living wage employer, they were very clear that uh, while they might like to pay their staff more, uh, that would mean it would be very difficult to compete in international markets. And I'm just interested to get your thoughts on that issue. How how do we how do we address that particular uh, concern where where wage levels are always going to be subject to international competition, or do we just have to recognise that you know some of these jobs are better done elsewhere? And are you looking for a short answer to those questions? No, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll be flexible for your first answer. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> there are a, diff a number of different models which different academics have put forward to try and explain, for example, why the UK's uh, performance is relatively weak against other countries, usually Germany. Um, um, and in the 1980s, towards the end of the 1980s, <clears throat> Um, a fairly prominent uh, American academic called David Feingold started suggesting that there were what we might call high-skill equilibriums and low-skill equilibriums. In other words, economies which more or less settle around having high skills and economies which more or less settle around having low skills. And within those economies, within those uh, uh, equilibria, there were knock-on implications for the workplace. In other words, the type of economy that you have influences the type of management, uh, the organisational governance structures that you have, the types of work organisation that you have, and the types of skill you have. So, for example, if you want to compete on low cost, it's likely that your workplaces will be tightly managed and have low-skill, routinized, low-paid work. So you can see the kind of chain which, which goes through here. And, and the, the kind of interesting question then becomes, can you break that chain? Or are you forever going to be locked into that? And it's clear that if you take that kind of model, uh, the kind of what's in, in the uh, high-skill equilibrium model, in terms, terms of the workplace, it's called the high road. Um, it's quite clear that there is a propensity in the UK to opt for the low road. 
Um, and there have been pressures in other countries, for example in Germany, which have been held up as a kind of high road, high skills equilibrium model, to move towards that. And in Germany they have made quite, in certain lander, they've made quite specific decisions that they will not compete with China. There have been pressures to do that. So for example in North Rhine-Westphalia, which is one of the states within Germany, there was a lot of pressure from their manufacturing companies to lower their costs to start competing with China. And their strapline was, you can't beat Beijing on price. And what they offered to do as a, as a local government was to fund initiatives with the social partners to go to those companies which were feeling under pressure and say to them, what can we do to help? And in some cases, it was about rethinking their products. In other words, could they position their products in different markets? Could they keep them in the kind of high value added areas? And in some cases, it was about rethinking their production. You know, could they do things differently which allowed them to be competitive still? And what was interesting is you've got a real partnership going on there between the companies that had to open their books to allow other people to come in. You had the trade unions involved. You had academics involved. And you had consultants involved. And in, in many of those cases, the academics acted as the kind of brokers between. Because in some cases, it was about, for example, rethinking work design. And so what you wanted were consultants to come in to help you change your work processes. So, the, so there is possibility for preventing people from moving down from high road to low road. But the question, key question, I think, for in the UK is how do we move from low road to high road? And there, I think there are two ways you can think about doing this. One is you block off the low road. And this is one of the things we with colleagues who have been very keen to say, and you encourage, or we, the phrase we use is you pave the high road, so you encourage companies to come down that. And it might be worth picking some of those issues up a, a bit later on, but I think in, in a kind of nutshell, that's where we are in, in the UK. Prensity to go down the low road, to follow the low road, and the trick for us is to think about how we can break out of that and move towards the high road. Okay. That, I mean, that's, that's a very helpful kind of top-level summary, but, but you know, just to drill down a little bit more, going back to the example I quoted you, um, you know, West of Scotland manufacturer uh, competition in in China and Eastern Europe, pressure on wages. So, how do they get from where they are today to where you think they should be on the high road? What's the what's the journey? If we accept there's a logic, which is your business strategy, the way you organise your organisation, through to your human resource, let's call it your what I think of as business development work organizational development, workforce development, if you think of that link, and if the causal chain goes from business, from where you position yourself in terms of business through to your workforce, what we need to do is help those companies rethink their business. So we need to help them with their business development. Because if it's true... Good question. <laughs> it ha the, the government has to take a lead on this. But... I don't think it's, it, it's, it's the task of government to start managing firms. There are contextual ways around, um, that, contextual with things that you can do around it. And one of the things I've suggested in my submission is we need to think about management education. I mean, if people think that opting for the low road is the easiest way forward, it, because it does make money. I mean, there are companies, we, as we all know, who have simplified work processes, which are low-skilled jobs, low pay jobs, and they make money. But what's very interesting about those companies is they do make money, but their relative performance compared to those companies which operate in, in high value added markets is diminishing. We know that from, from evidence across the UK. In other words, it's profitable now, but in 10 years' time, it won't be as profitable. So we have to start helping those companies do that. One way is to start, I think, re-educating leaders and companies and managers and companies to open up their horizons to think about something else. So one thing we should be thinking about is management education here. The other thing, which I think we do relatively well, but perhaps we ought to be thinking about <coughs> consolidating and expanding that, is helping people think about understanding and reading the market. I think, for example, there are lots of small firms who would like to offer better job quality. I, I would call them the kind of willing employers. They know the benefits of it, but they don't know how to do it, either because they don't have the capacity because they're running around like headless chickens in many cases, small people who own small firms, because they're doing lots of tasks. They're doing the finance, they're doing the HR, they're doing the marketing. They're doing, so they don't have the capacity to do it. Or in many cases, they don't have the capability to do it because a lot of, a lot of them haven't gone through 
an educational process. I mean, these are small entrepreneurs who are starting their businesses. So we can do things to help those people. We can intervene and, and help them read the market and understand the market and see where market opportunities are. And that is, that is where government and government agencies do have a role. Okay, okay I, th I, I, I know other members will explore quite a lot of these issues. Just before I, I bring in Lewis MacDonald, who I think wants to follow this up, maybe John McGurk, do you want to add anything or contradict anything that you've heard so far? No, I think um, that, you know, there is a, there is a kind of um, um, polarised argument between low road flexibility and high road competition. I think one of the things you have to be mindful of is the nature of the competition globally. Um, and the nature of the labour market uh, globally and um, productivity. So if you look at China, for example, China is often sort of used as a shorthand for that's what we need to compete against. China now actually has rising unit labour costs because it's used up a large surplus of migrating labour from the, the rural hinterlands. Uh, that labour force is becoming more assertive, even within a very authoritarian um, political structure. Um, China is now offshoring... Um, quite a lot of low-cost manufacturing to places like Vietnam, Indonesia, etc., Bangladesh, um, and you know the fact is that you know as the unit labour costs increase for producing high-value manufactured and finished goods, then a lot of them go back to Europe. Um, now the issue is which part of Europe do they go back to, um, and you know quite often you know the, the sort of Assumption is Germany makes the things that China makes things with, you know, machine tools, etc. But, you know, there are other um, parts of the European economy that can prosper by developing high value manufacturing niches, and Scotland is one of them. Um, but you have to be mindful about that. There has to be a really, you know, open dialogue between business, unions, government about how you develop a high road economy, and everybody's got a different view about how you do that. Um, the fact is that you will have a hybrid economy of companies, as, as uh, Professor Warhurst says, who are opening um, a, a, a very um, you know, sort of low-cost production model and quite profitable at that, but in the long term, you know, that's not necessarily sustainable. But how do you do that? And I think it's through innovation, skills and learning, and that's a very easy and glib answer. Um, but you know, there's a lot of evidence from international comparative research that that's the way that you build those um, clusters of high-value um, manufacturing and high-value high service industries. Okay. Briefly, briefly, yeah. We, we've had this position in, in the UK and in Scotland for about 20 years now that the way we compete against countries like China is that we will take the high, the high-value-added stuff and the Chinese will take the low-value-added stuff. And, and our response to that has been to expand higher education and have more high skilled workers as graduates. Two things have happened. One is we're not using those graduates properly. They're vastly underutilized. And the second is we fail to appreciate that China creates more graduates in one year than Scotland has in total. And we're just starting a project now in my institute looking at innovation and job quality in China. And it's astounding the amount of graduates that, who are created every year in China. And I mean, they will be competing on brains too in the future. I mean, just on that point, I noticed, um, John McGurk, in your submission, you say that 58.8% of UK graduates are in non-graduate jobs, which is a very striking statistic. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's, there's a long, um, you know, history of research uh, looking at, you know, it you know, is in a very simple um, sort of question um, to pose it. Are more graduates um, likely to lead to a more productive economy? And it obviously depends on what they're doing. It depends on the workplaces they're in. It depends on how their jobs are designed and enriched. It depends on you know how um, the, the competitive strategies are um, you know designed um, so that people can be more productive and higher paid. And if they're not, then they won't be. Um, we've just produced a, a major report on overqualification. Um, and what, what we don't see is, that, you know, obviously, you know, creating lots of graduates is generally a good thing. But what we've got to think about is what skills those graduates are attaining. Um, you know, and I mean, often we, we aren't focusing on those sectors that are going to be most productive um, for the international um, competition that we face. Yeah. OK, well, lots of members want to come in with follow-ups, but I promise Lewis MacDonald, first of all. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I was very struck by some of the evidence we've heard already, but... Uh, Chris Warhurst in his written submission said that what the UK lacks is a Ministry for Labour and, and that I, I guess points us directly to the question of 
if there is government intervention, what form should that take? And, and the discussion you've just had about graduates, I think, uh, illustrates governments of all parties have promoted higher levels of graduate uh, uh, completions, and yet um, that's not necessarily addressed those issues that you described. What should government be doing, and, and how should government be doing it in terms of uh, paving the high road or, or in terms of in enabling the right skills mix um, to come out of our education institutions. Is the current balance between further and higher education tilted too far in favour of higher education and not far enough in, in favour of trade skills? Um, if you just focus on the skills issue for, for, for a second, um, it's, it's quite clear that we are oversupplying graduates. Um, there was a belief following that log remember the logic I just talked about you start with your business development which filters through to your organisational development which filters through to your workforce development that was the chain but those people who were arguing um, that the point of intervention for government was in workforce development in other words increase the supply of graduates and the argument went something like you create all these graduates you put them into non-graduate workplaces or jobs they would bring all of these skills and abilities with them and they would start growing the jobs in order to accommodate them. Employers would have to reorganise their organisation, in other words, allow them to be able to make inputs and give them a voice, and that would somehow push firms up the value chain. They would have to compete in different areas to be able to accommodate them. It just hasn't happened. What we're seeing is graduates entering non-graduate jobs. Um, and the funny thing is, we don't actually know what happens to those graduates in non-graduate jobs. Well, two things. We don't really know what's happening to them. We've been conducting, just finishing off some research, which has been looking at what the effect of graduates in a state agency in Scotland, which has traditionally been a non-graduate job. And what we're finding is what we'd call hybrid workplaces. Graduates and non-graduates are doing exactly the same job for the same wages. And in many cases, employers really don't know what the graduates bring. I mean, they know intuitively that they're graduates and they should be bright and they should be blah, 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 blah. But beyond all of that, they really don't know what they're doing. In some cases, they hire them because they're available, not because there's a real desire for them. Uh, and the second thing related to that is we don't know what's happening to the non-graduates. We've completely forgotten that there's a huge swathe of people out there who are non-graduates, who, non who are now competing with graduates um, for, for their jobs. And are they going to be pushed out of those jobs in the future? In the middle... We used to have fairly bright working class kids who are now being encouraged to go to university but who would have gone into the trades in the past. And it's interesting, there are no huge skill shortages in Scotland except in the intermediate areas. Um, some of the work that I've been doing um, in Glasgow with some, some of the skilled trades, they're really crying out for apprentices. Good apprentices, the old apprentices, people who would spend three, four, sometimes five years learning a craft. And they can't find them now because these kids have been pushed into, into higher education. And where they're learning their skills is, in the words effectively of, of one of my interviewees, was at the board, not the bench. So they're, not, so they're great at doing computer-aided design, but you put them in front of some tools and they're, they're not skilled for that. That's partly because we've been encouraging people to go into higher education. And it's partly because the people who are teaching them have also gone through higher education rather than me at the bench. So there's some, a lot of skills issues we need, to, we, need to, we need to address in Scotland. So the short answer is, actually, yes, there is a need to rebalance. But if we are going to rebalance, we need to think about how, these, how people are taught. And I think this is a kind of slightly different question now. We need to think about a kind of pipe chain for apprenticeships, which does link to job quality. The people who are coming into apprenticeships, how they're taught, how they link to businesses because businesses will only take apprenticeships if there's a business need for them, and for the people themselves to encourage them to go into further education, apprenticeships rather than higher education, they're going to have to go into good jobs. There's no point in, in, in redirecting them from higher education to further education and apprenticeships if at the end of it they don't come out with good jobs. I'm sorry. No. I, I, was, I, I was going to ask the other side of the same coin, which is about blocking the low road and, and what more government can do and in this context I'm thinking specifically Scottish government and Scottish local government and public bodies what more uh, government can do to discourage employers from following the, the low value, low wage 
um, low quality jobs route. Well, I think you know w one of the key issues is is around um, you know if you're trying to compete in a global economy as a small, open, mature um, economy such as Scotland, then you know w what you've got is you know you do have um, a highly educated population. You know whether they are educated in the right sort of subjects, etc., is something that you can you can think about and address. Um, you do have um, established industries that have got particular business models that have developed over time. Um, and, and you do have um, a, a fairly active government that, that wants to intervene, in, and I, th I think in, in a helpful and supportive way. Um, and also, I think one of the issues about Scotland is it's, it's small enough to be scalable, um, and, and it's very clubbable, very well networked. You know, people can get together in different groups and, and do things that can make a difference. And I think the biggest impact is through innovation. Um, I think the Scottish Government's innovation centres, and I declare an interest here because I sit on the board for construction innovation or the C Construction um, Scotland Innovation Centre, um, and the chief executive of that board um, and the chairman specifically asked me to sit on that board because I had labour market expertise, but also because they, they, they knew that I had started off in the industry as an apprentice, um, as an apprentice tailor many years ago. Um, and, uh, and and basically, I went through a period of you know basically a very exploitative, low skilled <laughs> apprenticeship where we were effectively used as um, you know basically um, I suppose uh, you know manual labour, um, and I wasn't the big burly guy that I am now. I was a, a bit of a waif. <laughs> I had a white boiler suit, which is always a bad thing <laughs> on a Glasgow building site. Um, but the fact is that it, it made me reflect on the fact that, um, you know, that, that how much have things changed? How much have we changed the supply chain of skills? And the fact is that in the construction industry, that the industry is moving towards a revolutionary new form of construction. A lot of it has taken place in factories. A lot of it requires different skills, and yet we've still got a very male-dominated, very hard scrabble industry. Now, a lot of people in the industry are doing a lot to try and address that, but one of the key issues is if you drive innovation at the top, then people adapt their business models to that. Then you have to support the biggest sector, which is the SMEs, to try and compete in that. And that, that's a real challenge I'm sure we'll say much more about. Right. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll promise Gordon, I'll bring Gordon McDonald right. on, on this one, yeah, and then yeah. I'll bring Dennis in. Okay. Uh, I was just wondering what, what you felt about, uh, this is to John McGurk, you know, I was taken by the 59% of UK graduates that are in non-graduate jobs, and I was just wondering what you thought was should be the role of universities in that because um, yesterday in the Education and Culture Committee we heard that in Scotland there's 11,000 uh, ICT vacancies, uh, 150,000 across Europe. Uh, you know, engineering, you've already touched upon the fact that at technician level is a difficulty, but there's also a difficulty uh, for graduate engineers, which is having an impact on the ability to uh, for companies to grow. Um, so, you know, is the focus of universities wrong? Is it not that it's not the number of graduates, but it's the focus or it's the, the courses that the graduates have undertaken that are not uh, in tune with the economy's requirements? Yeah, I, I think the, the issue is that, you know, we do have, um, you know, lots of people doing um, humanities and professional degrees and not enough people doing technical and engineering subjects. Now, the thing is, without sort of having a centralised planned economy where you point the finger at people and tell them what industry to go into, how do you do that? You build, you know, we hope, um, the, um, the, the, the sort of desire and the aspiration for young people to go into those roles and not just young people because we've got an ageing uh, labour force in Scotland and we in CIPD through our Scotland Skilled Future report talk about from preschool to pension age and beyond. We have to think about the whole skills supply chain in the labour market and one of the one of the key issues is that we have to build young people from you know preschool, you know, which is well known to have massive benefits in terms of integrating the most excluded young people in the labour market at an early age. Um, we have to focus on you know good vocational education where appropriate in the school system and of course the developing young workforce um, Commission has made big strides on that. 
Um, but when we get to university, we have to think seriously about what kind of economy we're shaping up to. Now, I'm somebody that benefited from um, doing social sciences and, you know, aspects of um, humanities at university. You know, I wouldn't want to, you know, say that we shift the entire curriculum, but maybe we've got to think about having a slightly more specialised form of technical education in Scotland um, that would, that would, you know, um, fit in with our emerging industries um, such as biotech, you know, the IT industry, you know, green energy, etc. Um, we've probably got to think about that. And some people sometimes think that the, the polytechnic sector delivered quite a lot of those skills in a fairly focused way. So maybe sometimes we've got to go back to the, the past to think about our future. I think one of the things we often forget about higher education is it started off effectively as a vocational training college. Mm -hmm. It was for law, medicine, and the clergy. Mm -hmm. uh, and we sometimes view higher education through the prism of the 1960s mm -hmm. and, and liberal arts education. Now, with cost pressures on higher education, both from the top in terms of funding it and from the bottom in terms of people participating in it, there is now a legitimate question about what is the function of higher education. If it's to create a healthier workforce and happier workforce, you provide that liberal arts education. That's great. You know, you, you, you train people to be critical thinkers. Um, you do the thing where you know, they are able to engage in the world differently. But what's been very interesting over the last couple of years is there's research coming out of America which has tested the, let's call them, the, the, the thinking skills, as we used to call them in Scotland and the old Scottish executive, the thinking skills of students as they went into universities and as they came out of universities. And hey-ho, let's say it's very uneven. Some students actually diminished their thinking skills in university. Some did very well, they just plodded along, and some enhanced them. And I think, you know, one of the things I think we should be thinking about is looking at what happens inside higher education. Uh, and the, the UK government in England is, is thinking about this with, with HEFCA, this, this learning gain initiative. And it's actually, it's, it's politically with a small p, it's a, tricky th it's a very tricky thing to do, but it is an important thing for us to think about in the context of universities and higher education always being about vocational training in its broadest sense. The, the, the other point I was wanting to make on it um, was within the, the papers that we were given, there was two other stats that jumped out to me. One that says it found that only 36% of employees felt their managers usually discussed training and development opportunities with them. And the other one was that data from the UK Commission for Employment and Skills Survey shows that 28% of Scottish employers provide no training to their staff. Is that linked to the fact that there is an over-provision of graduates or is there other reasons for that, those levels? I think it obviously depends in, on the business and it depends on the, com the, the type of work that's um, undertaken. For example, it's very easy to say we train everybody because you do compliance training. Mm -hmm. you know, so you might have a, a, you know, be a um, hospitality and tourism provider who has to provide a lot of health and safety, hygiene, training, etc. And you might look like a higher trainer than somebody in another sector who isn't in that sort of compliance area. So what you have to think about is, you know, what would be, you know, and it's very difficult to drill down into what that industry, um, if it was taking a more high road approach, would be seeing as um, the appropriate training to equip people for that environment. But, you know, I, I wouldn't say that an absence of training is automatically a sign that employers aren't engaging with the need to increase their workforce. Um, but the issue is, you know, where, where people are in a complex and evolving labour market and they're not being trained, they're obviously not keeping up with the kind of skills that have to be developed. And that may well mean that they're working in a fairly low, low skill, um, you know, um, kind of low intensity environment where that's not necessary. Um, and, and that is a bigger picture for us in Scotland, how we build the industries that actually require training and skills, because the biggest issue around training is not just the supply, it's the demand from employers. And pro productivity in the UK over the last seven or eight years has started to fall. Is that a, a reflection of the lack of training that's, that's, that's out there? Well, I mean... <laughs> Productivity is, well, the, the term is multifactorial, you know, as in, you know, you've got capital, you've got labour, you've yeah. got investment. Yeah. Um, and we've just did some research in CIPD um, and a labour market team, which was published on Friday, which drills down into, you know, what employers are doing. We've got in panelled survey data, which looks into, you know, 
what they're doing in terms of capital, so what they're doing in terms of capital investment, you know, which is either substituting labour for machines or enhancing the productivity of labour through um, investment in machines. So, for example, supermarkets with um, automated tills, quite often the staff are doing other things like helping to introduce people to new products, etc., and, you know, giving more customer service. Um, and quite often they're showing people how to use the machines as well, yeah. Um, so the issue is how, how are people using capital and machines? Then there's issues about, you know, people who were... We, we had several cohorts of um, employer, um, and the most common um, in the recession, which you would, you would expect, was a kind of cost-cutting mentality, which chimes with the evidence that Professor Warhurst was given. Um, because they're in a survival mode, you know, they're trying to keep their businesses going in a very difficult environment, um, and quite often that means that you're having to, you know, suspend investment, um, make sure that you know you're battening down the hatches, etc., and you're you're on a survival path. As we are coming out of the recession, we're seeing more going towards trying to invest in both capital and skills, um, because you know it's it's obviously a circular argument. But if you invest in capital without skills, then you won't get the productivity out of the capital investment, and that's a key issue. And I can obviously make that report available to the committee. Okay. Right. Thanks. Thank you, um, Dennis Robertson. Uh, I thank you, convener. Part of what I was going to come in with the graduates has already been answered. But uh, in respect of, of the, the the graduate program, uh, Sareen Wood in his uh, report. Um, is, is more or less saying that you know universities and colleges have got to sort of be a, a bit better and they're, they're thinking of the pathways for their graduates. Now, I know in Aberdeen, uh, Aberdeen University, Robert Gordon's and North East College are working together, which is perhaps a new concept in terms of the college and universities working together, but they're actually working to determine what skills are required at the moment to try and, and encourage graduates to go down a particular path, but also to try and encourage people going through the college to take up particular skills. And the other thing is that I, I wondered you, what your opinion is. Should we be trying to ensure that there is no differential in our thinking towards someone who is a graduate from university or someone coming out of college? Because in terms of their ability and what they're bringing to society could well be uh, as just as uh, in terms of equality, just as equal, and we should be giving it a level um, status. Professor Warhurst. I think the short answer to <clears throat> this is a question about parity. Yeah. Um, and you know, again, we sometimes look back to a, a necessarily a golden age, but an age which was very defining in, in, in terms of a lot of our thinking, which is the 1960s, when that when we created that binary divide effectively. Um, and it looks as if it's, be it's become set in stone. But actually, if I look at somewhere like Warwick University, which is one of the leading universities in the UK, has a global reputation, we actually do a lot of what we would call vocational training, and we even have now the higher apprentices in, in there. And Warwick University, has uh, its, its manufacturing group, um, has created c schools, effectively, which are picking people up from the ages of 14 now to do, to do that. So there can, be models of there can be models of integration, but it has to be done properly. And I think there are, there, in terms of whether we can have parity, it depends on the quality and the level of further education. And it has further education, and I say this as somebody who might be shooting himself in the foot speaking from higher education. Further education has been relatively neglected across the UK. Um, and I think that's something, I think that's something we, need, we need to address. Um, beyond that, however, if we are going to integrate, we need to have some kind of system or mechanism for linking up not just the colleges and the universities, but what employers need as well. So in effect, we will be creating some kind of ecosystem where there will be some kind of meeting place, some kind of protocols, um, where we define the responsibilities and resources, where people are supplying vocational education in its broadest sense, whether that's further education or higher education, and even some of the private providers, with the people who are going to be using those skills, employers. And we, 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 we sometimes talk about you know, cl clusters in Scotland, but actually, we don't have effective mechanisms where we coordinate those clusters. And this is where the role of government can come in. Not as the person, not as, not as the institution, if you like, which, which dictates what goes on inside the clusters, but provides the form in which these clusters can, can meet 
and, and, and operate by creating those protocols. And this is something I think probably about seven years ago we, we tried to do it at Strat, when I was at Strathclyde. We tried to bring people together to say, what is the best thinking around something called skills ecosystems? You know, bringing all the parties together so we, we, we try and create some protocols in Scotland for how to operate in particular sectors, whether that's the creative industries, whether that's food processing, whiskey, whatever we want to define as our, our successful sectors, how we coordinate that. So that integration will only work if we've got the right framework around it, and that's a role that government can do, provide the framework. Um, I wonder, just to follow up to that, if convener... Uh, you may let me do this, is um, at the beginning when we took the evidence sessions back in June, <coughs> the CBI at that stage said it wasn't advisable for governments to determine what was uh, a good or bad um, quality of work and uh, we shouldn't even be attempting a definition. Uh, and what I'm hearing this morning is that there's a role for government, but do you agree with the CBI in some respects that it's not up to government to determine in, it's not up to politicians, it's saying, to determine uh, what is the, 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 the good or bad quality in terms of employment. Because think, in one similar respect, you're actually suggesting it is a role for government. Yeah. I, th I think it's up to politicians to create a dialogue around key issues, um, such as the future of work, um, and to listen to different um, stakeholders, different parts of society around that. And then to you know feed that into the policy making, it would be you know it, you know most governments do that. Um, obviously, if government comes up with a blueprint, that's less <coughs> desirable. If it hasn't you know had the expertise of industry, of unions, of other parties that have got a viewpoint on the future of work, um, and I think this, the Scottish government's approach is very much to create <coughs> that dialogue. From what I can see, so you wouldn't agree with the CBIs. I think I think it's 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 it, you know the the kind of polarising the issue. Um, the issue is that government should obviously be interested in the quality of the labour market. You know, it's part of you know how a society you know effectively functions. It's the critical part, and should be. Yeah. Thank you. I think there are many stakeholders with an interest in with an interest in job quality. All employers, in one sense, have an interest in, in job quality, whether they're interested in bad jobs or good jobs in, in creating them. The CBI is one of those stakeholders. It's got a role, and it has a legitimate voice. But its focus can be different from that of the government. They can their interests can coincide, but their interests can be different. The CBI may be representing certain employers. The role of the government is to represent its citizens <coughs> in, in its broadest sense. And when we start thinking about that, it may be that good jobs provide other outcomes than the outcomes that the CBI want. And this is one of the things I, I put in my submission. The Scottish Parliament and this committee have to think seriously about what they want from job quality. Now, if it's about making Scotland wealthier, then the point of intervention is wages. Move to a living wage, for example. If it's about wanting the Scottish economy to be more competitive through innovation, it's about focusing on, on work design and job design and that organisational development. But I think one of the things we have to bear mm. in mind about organisations like the CBI is they may speak with one voice, which is for the CBI, but they don't necessarily speak for all employers. Mm. And I think what we have to appreciate is that employers, whether in the public sector, and we think we include the public sector here, the private sector or the voluntary sector, are not all the same when it comes to job quality. Mm. There are some good employers out there who either by design or by default, because of the business systems or because they've got a moral engagement with it, provide good jobs in Scotland. They care about their workforce. There is another group of employers who I think are what I would call the willing employers. There are those employers who currently don't provide what we might say some of the best jobs, but would probably be willing to do so, but they don't know how to do it. You know, and this is, this is the link to the SMEs that I made before. They don't have the capacities, for example, or they don't have the capabilities. There's a third set of employers, I think, who are indifferent. And they, would, they currently offer bad jobs because there's no incentive to do otherwise. You know, why, why change a model that works? And there's a final group of employers who I would regard as bad employers. Their business model is built on creating bad jobs. Now, I think the bulk of employers are in those middle two groups, the willing and the indifferent. The extremes are probably those who are providing good jobs and providing bad jobs. But the government's responses to those employers has to be different. 
I think with the good employers, we should be lauding them and setting them up as exemplars to show what, what can be done. <coughs> for those who are willing, we have to provide the support for them. For the third group, the indifferent, I think it's about educating them. <coughs> and for the fourth group, the bad employers, that's where we regulate. <coughs> Do you believe that the good, willing and the indifferent are also... Um uh, mindful of the well-being of their employees because part of what our inquiry is is looking at the impact on obviously people's lives and their health and well-being. I suspect, I suspect the majority of employers look at their employees through, through, two, through two lenses. One is simply as, as units to help them achieve what they want to achieve. But on the other hand, they also realise that what, they, what em, those employers offer in terms of jobs impacts their employees and impacts their businesses as well. If employers are offering the kinds of jobs which provide employment insecurity, at the, at the first opportunity, those employees will leave. So retention becomes an issue for employers, and recruiting people costs employers money. So having a committed workforce which is <clears throat> engaged because they think their employers value them is cost-effective to, to employers. Yeah, thank you, John. Yeah, I mean, on well-being, very quickly, um, key issue when you're trying to compete in a global economy, you're trying to lift up the, yourself, you know, continually up the value chain, you're continually trying to innovate, etc. cetera. Um, you're going to have lots of shifts and changes. You're going to have disruptions and transitions. And what you need at the centre of that is resilience, and well-being is part of resilience. We talk about engagement, well-being and resilience as being the key sort of, you know, um, outputs we should be expecting from the workplace. Once we get people into jobs, we get them trained, we should keep them engaged, we should keep them well. And that obviously has, you know, benefits for the society that we're in with, you know, the fairly deep-seated um, health and socioeconomic problems we have. And we should keep them resilient so that they can be agile and adaptable to change. And that means giving them skills, giving them support and development. And it's easy to say all of that, you know, to do that on a government scale is quite challenging. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the key issues I've come back to is the fact that we need to create a dialogue around the need for that, what the role of government is, what the role of individual is, and what the role of employers are. Conscious <clears throat> for yeah. Two thirds of the way through our time, and there's a number of members still to come in, so we need to sharpen up a little bit. Um, I've got two members who want to come in on job quality. Um, Chick Brody, then Patrick Harvey. Chick Brody. Yes, good morning. Um, the last question it, it raises a new definition of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, I just wonder if I haven't yet heard what we mean by job quality. I know that we're doing. You know, in Australia, using our funds, which is great, developing a quality index. But you, Professor Waters, have just mentioned the good, whether it's a good job or a bad job. I just wonder, in terms of, of looking at, we talked about clusters in Scotland, and you also talked earlier about Germany. If you look at the Mittelstrand uh, ex uh, exercise in Germany, where there's involvement of the employees, there are small companies, and we mentioned the problems with or the challenges for SMEs, and they compete globally. Uh, I just wonder, is the Scottish economy structured the way that we think it should be? Are we trying to do too much, and should we focus on specifically developing the experience uh, in, in specific industries so that the brand of Scotland becomes much better known? I mean, I know what food and drink it is, uh, than it currently is. Uh, and just one other question to... to Develop that. Uh, Professor War has talked about training, which is absolutely imperative. Uh, I haven't heard the word leadership yet, which is more important. I mean, how do we find the leaders? I did mention the word leadership. Leadership and management. I think, I mean, I th when I look at, if you look at examples of where job quality has been improved, for example, in the United States, one of, one of the key drivers. Of, of that change has been leadership. But two types of leadership. One is political leadership, and the other is senior management leadership. So for example, if you look at some of, um, <clears throat> if you look at some of the work um, around, uh, I'm just trying to think of, of the building industry and construction trade in, in, in Los Angeles, 
there have been initiatives there where they've realized that it's not simply enough for the local state or the or local municipality to create employment standards. Those standards have to be enforced. And so what they've brought in is, is a model which uh, Janice Fine and colleagues would call tripartism, which is a, a strange word now in, in the UK, but was very prevalent at one stage, um, where the state provides sets of standards, employers implement them, but there's a third party which is monitoring them. Now, those could be trade unions. They could be community groups. But the trigger for them is the political leadership. It was very much driven by the election of particular mayors around Los Angeles. On the other hand, if you think about some of the initiatives around skills utilization, skills utilization has a whole set of practices you know, in, in the workplace, work, job design, work design, everything else. But it only works if senior management buy into that. And there is, for example, in Australia, the government has been putting money in to try and improve the level of education for senior managers, so around leadership and senior management. And that's one of the things flagged in my submission. I seriously think there is an exercise to be done in mapping what's taught in business schools in Scotland. Are we teaching the, the next generation the right things? Are we teaching them that job quality makes a difference? I suspect, I don't often bet, but I suspect if, if, we were to, if we were to bet on it, there would be absolutely no jobs on the importance of job quality being taught in Scottish business schools. There'll be lots on financialization, risk taking, all those kinds of things, but very little on what we might call the meat and veg, the stuff that works in, 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 in workplaces. And part of that has to therefore be about changing the way that leaders think. I mean, a very quick answer on the, the middle strand issue would be that, you know, it's a massively complex layered issue around how companies are financed, you know, the issues about patient capital, etc. I think Jim Mather's done some great thinking on this um, under the, um, the, the original um, uh, Fair Work Commission. Um, and we have to really think about how we develop a sector core of Scottish industries that can start to build that capability. And I think it starts with innovation and links down through education um, and, and looking at the whole vocational education aspect of it. But there's also a massive part around how business is financed, how we, how we treat you know, the returns to various stakeholders, etc., over time scale. And these are, these are very big challenges for any country. You can't adopt and import the German model wholesale, and I don't think anybody thinks you can. Forgive me, if I look at Tuscany, but with, mm. with, the, with the focus on furniture and, and the world renowned for that, Switzerland on uh, watches and chocolates. Yeah. I mean, I, the, my question is, are we trying to do too much? And should we be concentrating on fewer industries? You know, it can't be all just, just a few sectors, but uh, are we trying to do too much? Yeah, I think I think we can focus through the the innovation approach on key industries like oil and gas. Where we've got competitive advantage, and we've got a global profile: energy, green energy, construction, etc. Um, I think what we'll find out is, as the innovation process takes place, we'll see which industries can stand up in that competitive heat and can actually innovate. Okay, thank you. Okay, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Good morning. Dennis Robertson's questions actually brought it into the, some of the territory I wanted to explore. There's uh, perhaps understandably been lots of talk in the first half of the session about rising up the value chain and uh, whether wages or competitiveness are, are the, 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 the goal or the, the point of intervention. Um, those things matter. I don't want to take away from that. But even a job toward the lower end of the pay scale uh, can leave somebody feeling respected or treated with contempt, can leave somebody feeling that they've got a voice at work or, or less so, that they're being ignored. Am I right in thinking that what <coughs> Professor Warhurst was ta talking about, the, in the, the indifferent group of employers, that this is where the intervention is needed? The Scottish Government has limited options for regulating the genuinely bad exploitative employers, but is there a specific programme that could be designed within the powers that the Scottish Government has. We can't you know, necessarily expect recommendations from this committee to be uh, complied with by the UK Government. Are there things that the Scottish Government could do in relation to those wider aspects of well-being and job quality, which may be subjective, 
uh, but maybe within the power of, of the current devolved administration to raise standards up uh, in those other aspects uh, in that intermediate group, that, that indifferent group. I, th I think one of the things we need to recognise is that not all economies can be high-skilled economies. I mean, if, if, if everybody was a high-skilled economy, there'd be no competition. And, and in, in the same way that within countries, not all industries can be high-road or high-skill high industries. We, we know there are some... We know there are some occupations and in some industries which we're not going to make the kind of huge leaps up, especially in the short term, from, from low road to high road, if we, have, if we ever will. And one of the things I would probably invite the committee to think about, uh, the inquiry to think about, is, is something called employment enrichment. In other words, it might be that we can't, in the, at least in the short term, get, get organisations to rethink their work but we can get them to rethink their employment. And the two things are quite distinct. The work is what people do, whether they're bashing bits of metal, selling, selling records, or, sorry, I'm showing my age there, selling jumpers, um, or, or something else. That's their work. But the terms and conditions of their employment can be separated out, and we can think about trying to boost the, that employment. And, and there are a couple of areas you might think about. Health and safety working time, uh, contracts, pay, training, and paid entitlements. Some of those areas the Scottish Parliament has responsibility for. Some of them they haven't, but my understanding is they're pushing for them. So if you look at for health and safety, for example, we should, be, we should be not just making sure that standards exist, but they're being enforced. And I mean health and safety, I don't just mean physical health and safety, I mean some of the psychosocial health and safety. Same with working time. The European Union has, has, has indicated and has regulations on the length of working time, but we also have something which I would call, we should, we should have something called protected time, which is those kind of unsocial, unsocial hours. And when you, when you marry the two together, health and safety and, and working time, we tend to find that in research, unsocial hours affects people's health, working on social hours. If you're working constantly in night shifts, you're going to have illnesses later on in life. If you're, on precar if you're on a precarious employment contract, that also affects your health. It also affects intergenerational well-being as well. That's some of the research which has come out of the United States. So there, you can think about health and safety, working time, and contracts all bundled up together. Pay, we can think about pay. We can, we've been, you know, the UK government sets the national minimum wage, but Scotland has really taken a lead on pushing the living wage. Now, you can do that without regulation. It would be nice if Scotland moved to, a living, to becoming a living wage country. I mean, that would be a real branding for this country. Training as well. We've got some responsibility. We can, we can affect some of the, some of the training. Um, and some of that training should be helping companies to do jobs better and to do adv advances. In, in, sorry, we can use training to help companies do their jobs better and to get more out of their workforce. But we can also use training to help people get out of those bad jobs. You know, either through internal labour markets or external labour markets. And one of the things that the Scottish government was, 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 was good at in the past was something called the, uh, the Union Learning Fund. That really helped people at the bottom end of the labour market to take up education opportunities and for them to, to move not just from on a skills escalator where they improve their skills, but also jobs escalators. They moved up in, into different jobs. And we, with, with colleagues in Scotland, we do some work, work on that. And paid entitlements as well. I mean, we can't at the moment legislate in Scotland on, on paid entitlements, but we can ensure that they're being enforced. So there are things that we can do in Scotland, I think, to enrich employment at the very least. Uh, I mean, I was, I was interested. All these things are important. I'm not trying to, to take away from those objective <laughs> factors. I was trying to get towards some of the more subjective factors that impact on how somebody feels about the quality of their employment because we've heard evidence from NHS uh, Scotland about the impact that simply feeling that you're respected at work can have on somebody's health and well-being and then their ability to to progress in in work um, and I'm I'm interested in you know might be dismissive to call it those softer issues but I'm interested in uh, in what needs to happen to ensure that employers who may be in that indifferent category see these things as more important than they currently do? I think, I think there's, you know, obviously, 
you know, in cases where there's there's going to be um, abuse um, of you know people's rights in the labour market, then regulation is something that governments of all persuasions have been ready to undertake. Um, the the real issue is that you know you can't regulate every individual workforce and uh, workplace and every individual contract. What you can do is create you know a, 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 an aspiration to improve workplaces at every level. Um, and I think the work that the Scottish Government are undertaking under the Fair Work Convention is creating a mood that will actually drag a lot of those employers that are, in, are indifferent because they'll be in supply chains, they'll be part of larger organisations that will possibly start to put pressure on them to, to live up to different labour market standards, they'll be part of public procurement chains, etc. Um, so there are lots of opportunities through which we can actually um, address those issues. The, the, the subjective um, health and well-being issue is, is well known. There's a lot of research on the fact that it increases the profitability of firms um, if they've got high subjective um, well-being. So that in itself is a business benefit that has to be communicated. One of the things I've been really impressed by is the living wage campaign in Scotland where a lot of the benefits of actually paying higher wages and having higher skilled people have been demonstrated to organisations that had previously been unaware. That's part of dialogue. And in Scotland, we've got the scale and the networks to be able to do that. We should at least try that. I think the kind of questions around the kind of, let's call it soft power, to try and, try and influence these, the, 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 the kind of the, the willing and the indifferent in, in employers. I think the th three ways we can do this. One is the educative function that I mentioned before. We have to start thinking about how we educate senior managers and the people who are going through universities and further education. The second is, is about cultural change. It's, it's about creating dialogue and signaling that these things are important, as John was suggesting. And I think this inquiry and the Fair Work Commission are indications of that. We're flagging what's now important to the Scottish Parliament and to, and to the Scottish people. And the third, just picking up on John's point, is about public procurement. Um, we've talked in the past about, about public procurement and how it can be used as, as a lever to, to obtain, for example, uh, employers' training apprentices and things. But one small thing we could do is, is attach to public procurement contracts that the, the companies that win those contracts have to report on their job quality. Now, to do that, we have to make sure that it's not burdensome for the companies. So you do need some simple indicators of job quality, and you ask them to report on it as part, as part of having that contract. That goes back to a point we mentioned right at the beginning, which is what is job quality and, and those markers. So you can see that what is job quality is not an academic debate. It's a practical, it could well be a practical issue for you, but there's no reason why we can't ask those companies to report on their job quality. All right. I'm conscious of the time, we've got two members who want to come in still. Um, John McAlpin first, as, as briefly as you can. Thanks. I will be as brief as ever. I, I will be brief. <laughs> um, uh, pr Professor, um, in point 12 of your written evidence, I was quite struck by when you say when governments fail to act, trade unions and community organisations often step in, sometimes working together, but you go on to talk about how union influence has declined and uh, the responsibility for having a better job has shifted onto the shoulders of the individuals. Um, what role do you see for the trade unions going forward in improving job quality given this, this decline? It's, I think this is a, one, of the, one of the tricky issues around job quality. We know that in the past, job quality has been improved through the interventions of trade unions. And, and the, the good example of that is the US auto industry. Um, jobs, wages, prospects, health and safety were all improved because trade unions were given the opportunity to be able to, to negotiate with, with, with employers. We know currently um, that whether it's in Germany, and the involvement of supervisory boards, which are often underpinned by the involvement of trade unions, or whether it's even in, in places like Los Angeles, which, which I just mentioned in, in the construction industry and also in the janitors in the industry. Trade unions have got a real role in that. We know in London Citizens, as it first started off, which was where the living wage, part of the living wage campaign came in, that that was a community group which was ironically funded by American trade unions in London. Um, so there is a definite role for trade unions in this. I, I, the real issue for us is how we get trade unions to be, inv to be, inv to be involved in that. Given that trade union involvement in, in, 
in the UK generally is, is pretty low. It is slightly higher in Scotland than, than it is across the UK. But I think you're right. One of the issues is trying to find ways to do that. And we can do it at different levels, however. We can do it at national level by involving trade unions in part of that dialogue and cultural change. We can do it at, at industry or sector level. I mean, one of the things about Germany is that there are sectoral agreements. If so, all employees are covered whether or not they're in trade unions. And we can do it at the workplace level. So we need to think about, again, it's about where are the points of intervention. I'm mindful of the time. Well, I'm mindful of the time as well, so I'm quite happy with that. Yeah. Richard Lyle. Yeah. Thank you. I'm also mindful of the time, and, and Professor Warhurst, you have actually um, come out with quite a number of, of points which I'll, I'll take away and look at. Um, I'll go back to the 60s. I actually was employed in the retail trade for 20 years, um, went to night school, got certificates, and uh, got trained. Uh, nowadays, we have 24 hour shops, people working to 10 o'clock at night. You covered all the points, you know and some good jobs, some bad jobs, uh, in retail and care and, and hospitality. What further um, situations do you think, what, what further can be done by employers to improve the job quality? Because I would suggest that the, the job quality in retail has diminished in the last 30 years. I think one of the issues in the past when people did those kind of jobs, and, and people did work night shifts, I mean, my father worked night shifts, for example. But the difference between then and now is that they were paid differential compensations for those, which signaled that they weren't necessarily good. And this is what I mean by protected time. It turns out that protected time is important to people's health and, health and welfare. So we either signal that they should be compensated, or wherever possible, we should be encouraging employers to moderate those effects by having decent shift rotor systems, for example. And there's lots of work coming out of Australia uh, around this issue, how, how we might do that. I can try and, and push that towards the, towards the inquiry and committee if that would be helpful. Um, just, just coming on briefly on the point about trade unions, um, we, we do in the Scotland Skilled Future uh, report talk about the role of trade unions as part of the leadership of Scotland's labour market, if you like. So, you know, we ask employers to raise their ambition. Well, everybody does, but, you know, part of what employers should be doing is raising their ambition, competing internationally, focusing on exports, innovation, etc. Unions, I think, to be, you know, credible partners in this kind of, you know, Im improvement of the Scottish labour market, of the Scottish economy, have to move beyond their traditional bargaining agendas and have to get much more into trying to grow the cake and I'm a big advocate of unions. I've spent, you know, after my brief sojourn in construction, I was a train driver for 10 years. Um, I was a shop steward. I was involved in, in, in unions then. Um, later on, after a career in academia, I was the director of research for one of the most powerful unions in the country, which is now, you know, um, probably, um, you know, subject to a lot of challenges and pressures, which is the Airline Pilots um, Association, BALPA. Um, and um, I'm, I'm a big believer in the role that unions can play in developing um, an economy and a labour market, but, but they have to have a much wider discussion that goes beyond the traditional bargaining agenda. Um, I just want to come back briefly to, you made a, an interesting comment about you know, maybe doing yourself out of a job, that we should have more emphasis placed in <coughs> colleges rather than Universities. I believe that university. My, 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 I didn't have the opportunity to go to university. My, I made sure my kids did. And my, my son's now in a job which pays more than what I get, <laughs> um, and uh, I'm proud of that. But basically, should universities concentrate on producing our quality quality um, graduates of tomorrow? And your point about colleges. Uh, could you just explain again? what you feel colleges should be doing? Well, there, there, are, there are two debates, I think. One is, is about whether we want to maintain the binary divide between FE and HE. And, and I think that is a legitimate debate, debate to be had. <clears throat> um, if we decide that there are different levels of skill which requires, require different forms of pedagogy, then we might want to maintain that binary divide. If we think that there's a closing of the gap 
because technical education has become more complex and because higher, edu higher education has become very broad, and I use that word advisedly, then we may want to think about rethink the binary divide. But the second debate is about if it's kept separate, what is the function of higher education? Is it to provide a liberal education for young people? In other words, to make them re to generally give them a set of generic skills like problem solving and, and, and everything else? Or is it about training for the higher professions? Law, medicine, accountancy and everything else. And, that, and those are two, there are, there are two separate debates. One, I think, follows from the other. But they are very intertwined. We do, we do need to start thinking about some of, some of these debates. I mean, just quickly, my previous role in CIPD was heading up our learning and development research. And what we know about how people learn and develop is completely at odds with how we traditionally deliver learning in higher and further education institutions. We've got you know, the fact that you know, learning access to learning material and knowledge is almost limitless. Um, we still insist on assuming that people, you know, have to go through, you know, particular paths to acquire knowledge. Now, it's going to take a big shift in our mindset um, to start thinking about how we acquire knowledge in a much more fluid way. But um, one of the issues that I think could be a real separation is around the fact that, you know, like the work that's been done in the North East, and I've visited North East College, um, is that, you know, there has to be a, a real cooperation saying this is the kind of talent that we need in this labour market and this is how it's going to be developed over that lifetime that it's in work. Sorry to talk very subjectively about people, but if an individual is going to be developed, it's got to be across their lifetime because their skill requirements are going to be changing constantly. Yet we assume that people are finished articles at, you know, 21, 22. You know, I went to university at 26 and ended up staying there, which, you know, the typical mature student thing, once I got there, I couldn't leave. But the fact is that, you know, I had you know, a great education after contributing to the labour market and doing a productive job in it, you know, it served me well. I think more people should get that opportunity. Thank you. Mm. Brief final question. Um, I mean, I think this has been really, really interesting. There's loads of stuff for us to look at here. I suppose, how do we stop, however, just being seen by people in business as this is good works? Our inquiry is not just about the impact of low quality jobs on people's health and well-being, but on whether that therefore impacts their capacity to develop an economy that is a strong economy and can compete. And I was struck that CBI said we need flexibility, by which I think they mean jobs and security works for business because they can pick and choose, but at the same time said we need high skills. So I wonder how, what is it we need to say to establish... Um, or is it the case that actually a good economy needs good quality jobs with people involved? It's not just about being fair to people who happen to be in work. It's actually in, in the interest of the economy to do that. Well, well, the issue is that there's a mix of skills and qualifications and abilities in the labour market. And, you know, we obviously do what we can to make sure everybody has the ability to participate. Um, the fact is that, you know, part of, you know, building a sustainable global, internationally competitive, um, small, open economy is having flexibility as part of that, but it's not building flexibility in as something that is a perpetual feature of the labour market. And there are obviously atypical contracts and ways like, for example, zero hours contracts, um, which offer f flexibility, which many people criticise, but our research shows, you know, for example, job satisfaction from zero hours contract workers and typical um, contract workers is, is roughly the same. It's almost statistically insignificant. That actually the number of zero hours contract hours, the tenure of zero hours contracts are actually higher than a lot of full-time jobs when you take in the actual hours worked. Now, you know, there are lots of um, egregious abuses of zero hours contracts and we've submitted strong evidence asking, for example, for you know, the fact that um, zero hours contract workers should be compensated um, with at least an hour's pay and expenses when, you know, hours aren't granted to them. Um, that, you know, there's a written copy of terms and conditions um, no later than two months into that contract. You know, we think these are these would strengthen um, the, the um, rights of the individual employees whilst maintaining the flexibility 
that we need. But obviously the ambition is to get people into productive jobs that are high value and high earning. But we've talked about the complexity of that and the number of factors that are involved. So we need to be mindful that all of those factors are in the background um, and that we, we have to have a, a joined up solution. I, th I think, John, you're right. There is a danger in engaging job quality in that some bodies, some organisations will see it as purely about helping individuals. This is, about, this is an employee agenda. Um, I think there, there is an employee agenda here, and we have to be very clear about that. I mean, this is about um, making sure that workers in Scotland have job security, so they have income security, so they can plan. I mean, if, you, if you're not bringing in steady wage, it's difficult to plan your life. It's difficult to buy a house. It's difficult to pay for a holiday in, next summer. Um, if health, if your workplace in, adversely impacts upon your health, you are not going to be able to run around with your kids in the future. You're not going to see your grandchildren because you're not going to live that long. So there is an employee agenda here. But it's also very clear, despite what some employers say, that there is a lot to be gained for employers from job quality. It's about, we know that there are links between good job quality and higher productivity. We know there are links between good job quality, and as John mentioned, innovation. We know there are links between good job quality and employers being able to attract and retain the right sort of workers. So this is also an employer agenda. It's also, and this is where the Scottish Parliament this inquiry comes into it, it's about Scotland. There's an agenda here for Scotland, which is about if you generally want healthier and, and wealthier, depending on how far we want to class wealthier citizens, you need to look at job quality as well. And it's, you know, it, it, one of the things w which has become a, a, a mantra now, but is, is certainly true, is that we don't just need more jobs, we do need better jobs. We know that countries with job quality have higher rates of employment participation. In other words, there's more people in work. And we also know those countries with higher job quality have lower unemployment rates. Now, as academics, we can make links to all of that. In other words, there's correlations between that. The trick for academics, and we've not yet solved that, I have to hold our hands up here, is we don't know the causal links, how all those things work. And that's a, and that, and that's a task for us. But certainly, it's a task that we'll be pursuing if, with, if there are the right signals from Scottish Parliament and other places, that we should be doing this. Okay. Um, this is a, a fascinating discussion, and we could allow much more time, but I'm afraid we, we are already over time, so I have to, unfortunately, uh, bring it to a close there. But can I thank both our witnesses very much for coming along this morning and sharing your thoughts with us. Um, we'll now have a, a brief suspension to allow a changeover. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, if we can uh, reconvene, I'd like to welcome our second panel. We're joined uh, by uh, Liz Cairns, Research Officer for Unite, uh, Dave Watson, who's Scottish Organiser for Unison, and Rob Gowans, Policy Officer for Citizens Advice Scotland. Welcome to you all. Um, we, we'll run this till about 12 o'clock, I think. Um, uh, we've got a reasonable amount of time, but uh, if you saw any of the previous session, I think there's a whole range of topics uh, that are... Uh, that, that, that we get into, so I'd ask members if they would to keep their, their points uh, as shortened to, to the point as possible, and similarly answers as shortened to the point as possible it would be helpful. And um, given we have a reasonably disparate panel of members could initially address their questions to one panel member, if you would like then come to come in and, and uh, respond to a point and agree or disagree with your fellow panellists, just catch my eye and I'll bring you in as best I can as time allows. I wonder if I could start off, maybe initially address this question to, to, to Dave Watson um, and raise the question of the living wage, which is an issue which we've taken a great deal of evidence on. And I think you know, everybody would agree uh, that uh, the living wage is a good thing and, and you know, we should aspire to have it paid across uh, public and private uh, sectors. There was, there was an interesting issue that came up when the committee visited uh, Paisley uh, last week we met with uh, Renfrewshire Council, who have developed the ethical, chair, ethical Care Charter, where they aspire to uh, not just ensure that they pay the living wage, but all their contractors pay the living wage. But what was interesting was, in the afternoon, when we met some people from the local community, um, some of us met um, a local employer in, uh, in childcare, who said she would be delighted to afford to pay her staff the living wage, but couldn't afford to do that. Part of the issue was that the money coming from uh, the local council in terms of partnership provision wasn't enough to allow her to do that. And I suspect there's a very similar issue, um, Mr Watson, that, that you, you'll have identified in the care sector, which is another sector the committee's interested in, where, where uh, many care workers, I'm sure, are not paid the living wage. And employers in that sector might well say, well, until... Um, the contracted rates that we receive from council increase, we're, we're not in a position to do that. So I'd mean, just, just get your perspective initially on that question. If we're going to increase uptake of the living wage, what impact is that going to have on um, public sector contractors? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's fair to say I think we've made very good progress with the Scottish living wage in terms of direct employment. Uh, most of the public sector, there are one or two little bits but most of them both pay the living wage and have now got a mechanism for uprating it as well. So I think that's good progress. The key challenge is in procurement. Uh, and uh, obviously I was particularly asked in our written evidence to talk about the care sector, um, knowing obviously you're tripped down there uh, to Paisley. And I think uh, the constraints essentially, uh, and as to why the ethical care charter has not been picked up by more local authorities, are twofold. One is the legal issues, uh, and the second is budgets. So if we deal with the issue of the legal issues, the, 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 there has been a view, and the Scottish Government and us uh, disagree on the, on the legal interpretation of European law here, uh, that whether or not public authorities can specify, make it a mandatory, manda mandatory requirement uh, for um, public authorities to specify the, the, the living wage. Um, and that's been undoubtedly a blockage. We disagree. However, um, I think if you look at my submission, I pointed to both the Procurement Act. Um, we already actually have legislation called Section 52 of the Local Government of Scotland Act around for years that ought to deliver uh, the living wage. And now we're going to have, we've got some guidance from the Scottish Government, uh, and now we're going to have very shortly understand the regulations that we've been uh, working with government on are going to be published. Now, I think, you know, that's not going to say that you can mandatory, make a mandatory requirement, but it does set out a way by which public authorities can ensure that the living wage and, I stress, wider workforce issues are covered uh, in, in contracts. And I stress the, the wider workforce issues because there is a little point in the public body paying the living wage if then all that happens is a cut travelling time, put them on zero hours contracts and, and other, other poor uh, quality factors that Chris and others talked about this morning. So uh, I think there is, there is going to be a way forward there. So I think the legal constraints... Um, we can get round those. The second issue that employers rightly, rightly raise 
uh, is the issue of, of cost. Uh, and it is certainly the case uh, that bad practice in the care sector has largely been driven by bad procurement. Uh, and I have a lot of sympathy uh, for, if we look, use Chris's or Chick's good bag and the uglies um, analogy earlier, um, it's certainly true um, that there are some very good employers in the, uh, in the care sector uh, and there are some very ugly employers in the care se sector as well, uh, some very ugly ones, and I've, you know, I've interviewed members in some of those, that, that sector. Uh, frankly, they're not going to change their business model. Um, it's pile them high, that's their approach, uh, and they think they make their margins by essentially ripping off their workforce and actually ripping off clients as well. That's how they do it. But there is that group in between, uh, which I think you, you've heard from people like the, the care providers and others, um, who I think make the point that if the funding was there, then they not only would be delighted to do it, but actually it would save them money. You know, things like the high turnover you get in the care sector at the moment. I mean, I was talking to some of our senior social workers the other day who talk about they just aren't, you know, they've got contracts with providers, but there are no they can't actually get any packages delivered because these providers don't have any staff. Um, and it costs, I think, three, at least £3,000 per turnover for a care worker. This makes no sense. So I think we would argue in terms of costs that more money needs to be put into social care. I understand the political pressures on putting money in the health service, but frankly, it's social care uh, would help the health service as well in clearing back backlogs in uh, uh, bed blocking in hospitals so if we put the money into there it doesn't mean uh, there are also efficiencies from paying that though ever you wouldn't have the turnover and there are all the other advantages the living wage delivers which have been recognized by the best private employers so I think the, the legal constraints I'm hopeful we can get over in the next few weeks uh, when the new statutory um, regulations are, are published because that's a must do for local authorities and others uh, unlike the current a voluntary guidance and the second issue is about getting some more money into uh, social care not that, so that we so that those employers can meet those requirements yeah. so you, so you do recognize that there are there are employers who, who would aspire to pay more but yes. because of the contracts that are coming down Absolutely. they can't afford to do that okay um let's do you want to add anything to what's been said or? well um, just to pick up on the issue with regards to procurement that Dave mentioned there, one of the, the issues you know we would like to ensure would be that you know when it is paid, the living wage is paid across procurement, that it, it also reflects in the subcontracting element because you often see a situation where you know it's agreed at, at the contract level, but then that contract is then subcontracted and can be sub subcontracted, and before you know where you are, you're quite a distance from the good intentions that were set out at the beginning. So um, that was that was one of the things that I had um, raised, as well as that you know I was pleased to see you know. The organisation Lidl and Morrison's um, coming up with the, li the living wage and ensuring that that's going to be delivered um, for, for thousands of um, workers within the supermarket industry. So um, that was that was all. It was just that particular issue with procurement. Thank you. Um, I, I've got another question, but I think Joe McCabe wants to go in with a supplementary. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't want to misrepresent Renfrewshire Council when we were there, the head of procurement, when she was outlining uh, that the charter was very specific, that they could not mandate the living wage. That was their, their view. And obviously that's also the view of the Welsh Government and uh, Glasgow um, local authorities. So it's not just the, the Scottish Government that's saying that, as I'm sure you're aware. O on that point, there is obviously, you're talking about other ways that you can do it, and you'll be aware of the Scottish Procurement Policy Note on the 4th of February 2015 that makes it clear that public bodies they cannot mandate the living way, but it's possible to encourage suppliers to play a living way as part of the procurement exercise. I take it that you're, you're supportive of that policy, no? Yeah, I mean, we disagree on legal points, and you know, other committees have heard us. We, we've, we've given our legal view on, on these issues. You know, a lot of play is made, for example, of the Dortmund case uh, recently, and that's covered where... But, you know, the facts of that case are that the work in the Dortmund case was actually done in Poland uh, because it was data input, uh, which is just not a comparable fact to the one we have here. Either way, to an extent... You know, we can argue about, you know, as a lawyer, I love to argue about the fine points of law on these matters. The important thing is, what do we achieve at the end of the day? I think the procurement guidance note was very helpful, and I said so. Our guidance to, to, to branches points to that. Um, I, I'm, I will also welcome, I've seen the draft of the, of the regulations when they come out, because I think it, it shows a way of doing it. Um, but public authorities have got to do it. 
um, you know, there's no point issuing glorious guidance notes, etc., if people don't actually do it. Uh, and doing it means setting a clear procurement policy which says the living wage and broader workforce matters are, a, this is our procurement policy. And then you don't have to then specify the fine points of the detail there. You then evaluate contracts and give a weighting, a very significant weighting. That would be another challenge, uh, with no point giving tiny little weightings for, for the wrong things, giving significant weightings for living wage and other wider workforce matters. Now, I think if we get that right, frankly, most people bidding for contracts will recognise if you're one of the ugly employers who wants to, to, to operate in that particular old-style model, you're probably not going to bid. And there's some evidence in some parts of Scotland that I've been to where local authorities have had this discussion. And what's happened is the ugly employers have said, game's a bogey, I'm off. Uh, and actually, they've managed to negotiate with a better one. So I think the legal stuff is doable. OK, thank you. OK, thank you. Um, OK, I'm gonna, I'll bring in Joanne Larmont in a second. I just want to, to, one question I wanted to ask um, to uh, Liz Cairns, just picking up an issue you identify in the written submission from Unite. There's a statement you make in uh, page six of the submission on, on wage distribution where you say, since 2008, we have seen a larger share of national income going to the top earners, creating a widening income gap and greater income inequality. Um, but all the, all, all the um, measures, uh, published measures, show that income inequality has reduced since 2008. So I'm wondering where this, this uh, evidence to support this comes from. Um, I must have another um, copy of the, the submission. But um, no, there is definitely um, you know, a, a, a movement in, with regards to income distribution. However, if you look at evidence from um, or any research done by the High Pay Commission, there is, there is undoubtedly a, a shift in the difference between those at the top and those at the low, lower end of the wage um, spectrum. Um, I've got some figures with regards to um, information on um, jobs. And um, in the 1990s, um, the difference between high, high earners and, and average wage was 60 times. And we're now talking, at, you know, within FTSE 100, the difference between high earners and the average wage in, the, in a company within FTSE 100 is 160 times. So there, there is undoubtedly um, a situation where the um, companies pay um, the diver is diverging between those at the top and those in the in average pay and the lower uh, lower side of the earnings scale. I'm looking at the, the Scottish government's publication on poverty and income yeah. inequality in Scotland, which goes into this in, in, in some detail. They, they measure the, the, the Gini coefficient for Scotland, which is the, the, the measure of uh, income inequality, which in 2008-9 mm -hmm. was 34, by 2013-14 had reduced to 30. So it's very, you know, a substantial reduction. They also measure the percentage of incomes going to bottom and top three deciles, which have actually reduced since 2008-9. Now, the figures are not, are not massive, but the, 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 the trend is certainly downwards. And yeah, I'm just concerned you've got something in your submission that I can't see any evidence to support. Um, well, I think there's, there's, as we say, you know, there's, there's, as a research officer, there's, there's lies, damn lies, and there's statistics. So we can all pull out something from somewhere that would, you know, you know, give over our particular yeah. angle. But um, okay. I've certainly seen um, evidence where our members are are not feeling that um, that benefit that you're suggesting is, is there. Um, okay. I, I, you know, I, I heard earlier um, that they're looking for specific quotes from um, members or from, you know, our, our workforce. And I've certainly brought a number of things today with me with regards to personal experiences of people who are yeah. saying exactly that, that they're not, um, they're not getting a fair share. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure you, there will be anecdotes like that. I'm just, yeah. I'm just making a point yeah. about the, the published data that we have available to us, which but if you have anything that, that supports your your, can, your, your view, perhaps you can feed into the committee. Yeah, that would be, be helpful. OK, thank you. Um, OK, I'll bring in Joanne Lamont. Can I just ask, just, a, just for your comment on, first of all, um, Professor Warhurst's suggestion. I'm talking about procurement. He said that at least something you could do would be ask those who benefit from the public purse to comment or report on job quality. Do you think that would make a difference? I do, uh, and actually, there's an opportunity to do that in the in the in the guidance that's about to, about to be issued. Because I think it's very important to understand that 
the procurement agenda is not just about living wage. It's very important. Wages are absolutely key to this. But if you look at, for example, the work we did on in the care sector, it was very obvious that there was also big issues about job quality. And uh, in the new regulations, um, essentially what uh, local authorities have the opportunity of doing is to specify in their procurement policy just the sort of reporting requirements that Chris was talking about. So I think councils can do that in, in the new in the new guidance. Uh, and then what happens is if they set out that that's, the, that's a requirement, the, the new contractors bid on that basis and say, yes, we will do it. Then you incorporate that in the contract. So you're not imposing things because essentially people are bidding on that on that basis. And that's how we get around the legal issues that, that we talked about earlier. So I think that would be very helpful. There are issues about, and your, your inquiry has highlighted all the issues about how you define some of those. But we've been doing tender evaluation now under the old Section 52 provisions and the PPP protocol. And we have checklists that we give our, our uh, representatives on evaluation panels, and they include a whole range of things about quality of work, etc. So it's not difficult to do. There are things you can measure, there are things you can ask, uh, and I think that would be a, a very positive way forward. You, but you do it as part of the evaluation rather than as part of any tender specification to get around the, the perceived legal issues that concern the Scottish Government. And certainly if the focus is not just in the benefits to the individual, but to the quality of the service, Absolutely. then it would allow providers to... I think that, that was, to me, that was crucial. Um, when I did the focus groups around our time to care report, uh, essentially in the, in the care sector in Scotland, there are two spikes of workers. There are those in their late 20s and those in their late 40s. Those in their late 20s, when you talk to them, say... We want to get out as quickly as we can. The moment there's a job in Liddles or anywhere else, we're leaving the care sector. Those in their late 40s have been around a long time. They talk about time to care. They can t tell you a time when they could spend time with their clients and they can no longer do that because they're rushing around just trying to do the 15-minute and other types of care visits. So the quality issues for clients and, and, uh, and others is absolutely crucial to this agenda. Can I ask, too, then, um, on the issue of trade union representation and we're very struck in some of the, the evidence from citizens advice on actually what it was like to be a care worker and I'm sure from, from your experience as well that the extent to which people are six hours work but it takes them ten hours or whatever to get to and from the work and I think these are stories that probably need to get out there. What some of the evidence has been given to us tells us that trade union there's a concentration of density of trade union membership in public admin, education, transport, health, social work activities. But what is the distinction within health and social care in terms of trade union representation between public, third and private sector? Um, the density, I mean, there are 200,000 people just under work in the care sector in Scotland at, at the moment. The problem, however, is 70, well, say problem, the, the fact is that 77% of those are in the home care sector. Um, that's predominantly in the private and the voluntary sector rather than the public sector where trade union density is, is much higher, where there are partnership and other arrangements. Um, that's not to say that there's an anti-trade union attitude from all employers in the private and the, pub and the voluntary sector, quite the opposite. There are we have recognition agreements with a lot of those, those areas. Obviously, the ugly ones, we don't. Um, um, the, um, the, the, the difficulty is, the, um, is, is in that sector that in years gone by, home care workers would have come to a community base. They would have uh, had you know, regular discussions. You could actually meet your members. You could organise, etc. Now, particularly in the private and the voluntary sector, people go straight from their home to their first place of work. From a trade union perspective, that makes it a challenging organising task to do that, particularly when the employer might not exactly be encouraging you. I mean, literally, we have sent organisers into local supermarkets to, to recruit um, uh, home care workers because a lot of them, that's where you actually see more of them. You can see the uniforms. So, I mean, I've done it myself. I've literally en engaged um, with workers in those settings. But, yeah, it's an organising model. This is not easy. Uh, and uh, part of the issue, I think, is we need to think in terms of public service reform um, about how we join up some of these services. So that Because in the old days, a home care worker, if you saw Mrs McGuffey wasn't well, would go back to the base and would probably pop into the G 
GP and say, or say to the senior social worker, you know, Mrs. McGuffey's not looking very well. Um, I think someone ought to go and see him, the social worker or even the GP would go and do it. It doesn't happen now because there's no feedback of that nature. And, you know, we've, we argue we should be reinventing a sort of hub system in real communities to start to get some of that informal soft power guidance in there. So it's about public service, how we organise them, as well as the quality and the issue for individual workers. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I think given your exchange with Liz Cairns at the beginning, it might be worth uh, mentioning something uh, which um, time was against me last week on uh, from the Scottish Government's uh, economic strategy, the March update, um, showing that from 1997-98 through to 2010-11, uh, the share in total income amongst taxpayers in Scotland uh, saw a huge benefit for the top 1%, uh, only the top 17% saw any significant benefit and most of the rest of the population have seen a decline in their overall share of the national income uh, that's going to them. And I think uh, the richest 1% of taxpayers and nearly 7% of total pre-tax income at the start of that period had risen to 8% by 2010-11, meaning that that 1% of taxpayers had an income greater than the bottom 20% put together. And that's pre-tax income, so it's before uh, those more recent years when very wealthy, high-paid individuals will have had a, a 5p tax cut from the UK Chancellor. So I think it's worth uh, just reflecting on those, those figures given that earlier exchange. I suspect that both Unison and Unite will agree with the basic proposition that a, a higher level of uh, union membership uh, globally, that there's good evidence to show that it uh, results in flatter wage ratios uh, in a, a range of, of better employment practices. So rather than just asking whether you agree with that, uh, I'd like to ask what do you think is realistic in terms of Scotland taking action to achieve a higher level of uh, union membership uh, uh, as well as good relationships between employers and trade unions. Is it realistic to get back to a, a period of high unionisation? Uh, and if so, what can the Scottish government do without the power to regulate the employment market to try and help achieve that? Well, the, the Scottish Government may not regulate the market, but there are sectors where I think we could do some of the things that Chris and others have talked about, which is, for example, there's a lot of Scottish Government money, and the convener mentioned it in terms of the need to put that money in the care sector. If you look at, for example, at the residential care sector in Scotland, um, there is a national rate for, for, the national, for the residential care sector agreed with the Scottish Government, COSLA, and essentially engagement of the, of the employers there. Um, we don't have an equivalent rate. It's left to individual authorities and the home care sector. But my view is, and increasingly I have to say the view of a lot of employers in that sector, is that we ought to have perhaps a national rate uh, in that sector as well. If you do that, it seems to me you've got the basis of sectoral bargaining for that sector, of the type that Chris was talking about. Uh, because essentially what you've got is a tripartite arrangement whereby this is largely funded out of the public purse, and it's the Scottish Government's public purse at, at the end of it which does that. I, um, there are agreements uh, around that, and it seems to me you could tie that in to a range of, um, of employment and wage issues. And I agree with, uh, with John McGurk from, from CIPD that I think that would include a wider bargaining agenda. Uh, so sectoral bargaining, collective bargaining at the end of the day is the thing that we look from all the academic studies across the world that drives this. Um, but collective bargaining, particularly when you've got some of the more ugly end and some of the more difficult to organise areas, then sectoral bargaining will, I think, give a kick in the right direction. And I think in, certainly in the care sector, which is 7% or 8% of the Scottish workforce, so this is not insignificant, would be a good model for taking that forward. I'm sure there are others in the private and sector which which I'm probably less familiar and Liz will be more familiar with, but certainly in that sector, that would be a very practical way of taking it forward. Sector by sector approach. Yeah, sector by sector. Public yeah, not a big bang. Let's particularly starting with those where the public sector money yeah. is going in there and can leverage. I wonder if Liz Cairns would like to comment on the, the wider economy and how we yeah. engage with this. Well, obviously, beyond the um, Unite having um, you know 
membership in 23 industrial sectors is able to sort of you know have a unique position into this and and we would certainly support a, mo a move to sectoral bargaining um and and obviously um the um putting in place um national agreements where we can possibly get those agreed um however one of the um, issues i would um be mindful of is is the situation which we're increasingly seeing where national agreements are being right ridden roughshod over um you know with regards to um sp specific issues in one particular in the construction industry where um, unite has a national agreement in place which is being bypassed with a uh, an organization that's subcontracted to mechanical and engineering work to a danish organization um, um, and Unite in that situation had also negotiated with the employer um, a 10% apprenticeship target, um, which has now been basically ripped up. So despite you know, us wishing to move to sectoral bargaining, which is certainly something we would want to, to see, we need to ensure that national agreements are maintained and abided by in, 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 in particular, you know, rather than being in place but not being um, adhered to. So. I mean, it does seem to me there's a there's a huge barrier as well in relation to some of the more uh, exploitative ends of the, the labour market that we've heard from, particularly in uh, the retail sector and in uh, hospitality, catering and so on, um, where the, the, the level of union membership is so low uh, that the, the question about the relationship between unionists and employers simply doesn't arise. Uh, how do we how do we resolve that? How do we culturally change the expectations uh, and give people who may be on zero hours contracts a reason to think being a member of a union is a worthwhile thing to do? I think we need to move to a situation where rather than you know opt for zero hour contracts, we're actually pursuing a, we're pursuing permanent direct employment. Um, I think that you know when you have that ability, you're employed um, on a permanent basis directly with your employer. You've got the ability to um, if, if the situation arises, take cases to employment tribunal. You've got the ability to challenge your employer more so than you have if you're employed as an agency worker or employed in a zero hours contract. Um, precar these precarious um, types of employments don't also allow the um, ability for people to challenge some of the behaviours that would, you know, um, that, that come out of precarious work. I wanted to come on to employment tribunals uh, as well with Citizens Advice Scotland. Is is this yeah, appropriate now? Or do you... Okay. Uh, if, I wonder if I could turn to, to Rob Gowans then. Um, the um, case that your written submission makes against employment tribunal fees, to me, is a very strong case, and the, the, the arguments against it are, are clear. There's a, a, a commitment from the Scottish Government to abolish those fees as and when the powers are formally devolved. Um, do you have any understanding of where we're at with that, when we can expect that to happen, and also whether there's any clarity yet about whether employees south of the border will retain, as they may at the moment, the ability uh, to seek uh, to access an employment tribunal in Scotland mm -hmm. if their employer operates in Scotland? Uh, do, do we know whether that jurisdictional issue is still going to be relevant? Uh, and can that become a case that puts pressure on the UK government to change its position once the Scottish government has? And certainly from what uh, I understand, there's, there's still jurisdictional issues to be worked out in terms of what, what would be a, a Scottish case and therefore eligible to go to, um, to a Scottish employment tribunal. Um, I mean, in terms of the, the Scottish government's commitment, we really welcome that. That's something that we've... Um, the case for over a number of years that the employment tribunal fees should be should be abolished and it's basically um, diminished the, the amount of cases in the that've got to employment tribunal by eighty percent. Um, I mean in terms of when um, when the powers will be will be transferred, um, twenty seventeen's got the, the figure I've got in my got in my head although it's sort of I can I can find out what the what the latest state of play is with that. Um, I mean, in terms of moving towards it, I would hope that um, that it would be a sort of a positive sign um, south of the border. I know that the um, the Ministry of Justice is looking into down there and reviewing 
reviewing fees and the, the whole system and whether it's it's done what was intended. And I think it would be interesting to see the, the sort of two systems side by side. Um, one of the things, the, the most important things for us would be that people who who have had their, their rights infringed at work would have access to justice. One thing that I think we we can do, do better on in, in Scotland that I think we would have the power to do just now is to improve the rate of, um, of payout of awards. At the moment, um, something like 41% um, of people who win the case at tribunal don't receive any of the, um, the money that's due to them. Around half um, don't receive their, their award in full. Um, I think there's, there's stuff that, um, that we can do around that. The rate in England is, is slightly better, although, although not brilliant. Um, and I think there's, there's some things we can do around um, making sure um, that, um, that people are able to, to sort of pursue the, the employer and they've got the support of the, the sort of sheriff officer system to, to do that because we've seen, we've seen people where um, they've been awarded sort of £10,000 or more and their employers, their ex-employers va vanished off into the, the thin air or in some cases where um, they know perfectly well where their ex-employer is, but um, but they they aren't able to, to sort of pursue them for the for the money. So I think there's there's something in there that we can um, that we can get onto. And assuming that sometime, hopefully early into the next mm -hmm. Parliament, uh, tribunal fees are abolished, mm -hmm. uh, do there remain other barriers to people accessing justice in these situations, which we we still need to. Uh, Address. I'm thinking of areas like um, enforcement capacity. Even mm -hmm. if existing legislation is, is whether it's devolved or reserved, if the mm -hmm. enforcement is happening locally, but the capacity mm -hmm. isn't there, um, other 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 barriers mm -hmm. that we need to address there. I think there's um, a range of things around um, enforcement of the national minimum wage, enforcement of um, making sure that um, I'm being down on on bogus, bogus self-employment where. Um, employers don't don't pay their employees tax and national insurance, and in some cases, um, it's not that's not clear to the the employee for a number of years. There was a, um, a case we saw recently where someone got a letter from HMRC to say the employer didn't pay your taxes three years ago, um, which was the first that they they knew that they were self-employed. Um, so I think that there's plenty that can be do um, be done. A lot of the cases that that we see of poor practice are where they are technically illegal, but there's very little that um, that the employee can do can do to challenge that. Whether it's it's fear that they'll be um, they'll be disadvantaged, whether they they haven't been in in post for for two years, or whether they can't um, can't afford the the tribunal fee, the fees will will go. But I think there's there's still a lot more that can be done in terms of proactively enforcing um, what's basically um, basic employment employment rights that are, that are already enshrined in law. Thank you. Um, Richard Lyle. Thank you. Um, can I uh, turn to Rob Gowns? Uh, I'm sure Dave and Liz may want to come in, but basically, first of all, can I compliment the Citizen Advice Bureau for the work that you do and, and the many constituencies you've helped over the years that I know personally know of. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had um, Denise Horsfall from the Department Director of Work and Pensions, and she went on about the flexibility of universal credit. And amongst the examples you've given, some glaring, shocking examples of people who are in full employment, full time employment, earning £7 an hour. One lady in the east of Scotland uh, works 35 hours a week, finding it difficult to manage her rent, council tax, other essentials. The client has council tax arrears, and then you go on to severe in work poverty and other examples which are, are totally shocking. Um, but you also, within your submission, you have listed what you believe that you should be talking to the UK government, and most of this is the UK government, not us. Uh, Denise uh, Horsfall said that flexible universal credit would comp compensate when people uh, um, were in a situation of uh, not getting a lot of work or whatever, which I disputed uh, and I've yet to be proved, it used to be proved right. But you've come on to say that you remove employment tribunal fees, which 
already has been covered. Increase the efforts to enforce payment of national minimum wage. Review the support by current tax credits. I think the, the, the one where really it comes in is the strategic approach should be taken across government to ensure that the rises in national minimum wage and changes to the tax and benefit systems are complementary with the aim of ensuring that workers are better off and do not face in-work poverty. All the points that you put forward, what discussions have you had with the UK government and, and what pressures are you putting on them to try and see what, how, how we can resolve some of these problems that we have? I mean, we certainly have a lot of um, discussions with um, the Department for Work and Pensions at, at all levels um, to um, basically improve um, the system for the, the clients we see that have sort of a range of, um, a range of issues um, working within the the benefit system, which is which is the the sort of biggest area of advice that we that we give. I mean, in terms of the the sort of duration of uh, of tax credits, um, I was going through that um, that submission yesterday, and I realised it was written before the summer budget, where there have been some changes made, and I, I think the um, the rise in the national minimum wage is welcome. The the cuts to the tax credits are, are concerning. We saw the effect of um, sort of previous restrictions on eligibility in, in 2012, um, and um, that there was there was reduced support. Um, I mean, in terms of the the flexibilities around universal credit, um, um, doing sort of quite a bit of work to um, to assess what the early evidence is of universal credit and work. Um, inside um, the DWP to try and flag up early issues that, that are emerging um, in relation to um, things that's, that happen when it's, when it's tested. Um, there will be a certain amount of flexibility within, within universal credit, but um, ultimately um, it's, not a, it's not a huge amount of, of money. And it also, there's, there's some flip sides to that as well. For instance, at the moment, you're not... Um, a person's not supposed to be sanctioned for they turning down a zero hours contract because there's not enough hours on it. Now, some of the indications from the, the DWP have been that because universal credit is integrated in, in and out of work benefit, that'll all be fine within the within the benefit system. You won't you won't have the problems. So um, people might be expected to take up um, take up a, a zero a work on a zero hours contract even if it doesn't suit them on pain of sanction. Now that's um we would be quite quite concerned about both in terms of because of the the problems with we've seen with um clients being sanctioned but also the the misuse of zero hours contracts that's that's both sort of led um sort of caused hardship for clients and also caused sort of great difficulties in practically being able to enforce their their rights at work so um so yes we do discuss discuss um things with them um Realise that you know if you're going from week to week and your hours are changing, mm -hmm. you know you really could be down the office every week mm -hmm. filling out a form, and it, yeah. and it ain't one single form. It's mm -hmm. like War and Peace. Mm -hmm. You're saying that you're you're signing twenty pages or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Not you know, and, and you can't do it online because mm -hmm. uh, you know people in, in uh, poverty don't have uh, you know a computer. Mm -hmm. um, so, do you agree with me that? The system is still fraught with so many phone filling, time wasting situation where you know we really need to get to grips to try and improve it for mm -hmm. for people who unfortunately are in that situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's a lot um, a lot of issues with the with the in work benefit system and particularly on um, on flexible work and issues where people's hours change. Um, at the moment, um, we've got um, benefits, um, job seekers allowance, and working tax credits. Where, at one point, um, you're eligible for one, working up to a certain amount of hours, and on a certain income, working tax credits another. Um, where, in practice, people might be eligible for one one week and one the, and one the next, um, and in practice, they um, they don't claim um, they don't claim either. Um, I think that that's that that may be one of the the sort of qualities of of universal credit. There's there's still a range of a range of uh, a range of issues that I think it would would be ironed out with that. But it's um, in practice um, certainly until 
um, um, for the next um, while. I think we'll continue to see um, clients who are in work, um, who are struggling to pay for essentials and aren't able to access support from the from the in work benefit system. And, and just the last last question. This might sound so far off <laughs> the wall. Shouldn't we not have, rather than a minimum wage, have a, a weekly national income for people? That sounds really think, off the wall. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's uh, it's an interesting idea, and um, it's um, said in submission. I think there's there's quite a bit that can be done in terms of when um, sort of wages rise, when um, there are changes to the benefit system and. Um, Changes to the tax system that to make sure that they're they're integrated. Um, the Joseph Roundtree Foundation does a great amount of stuff on the minimum income standard, so I think there's there's a lot of stuff in there. And the reason yeah. I asked that, I'll just finish off, convener, was that in one of your submissions you've got a lady who's earning seven pound per hour, works thirty five hour weeks, which basically her income is two hundred and forty five pound a week. Mm -hmm. She's struggling. Mm -hmm. She's struggling, mm -hmm. right? Which her income really is under thirteen thousand mm -hmm. pound. Uh, and, and that's where, you know, okay, I know the Scottish medium wage comes in, but thank you very much. It's not uh, that off the wall, I think, um, so, you know, you don't, you're not uh, cutting too much territory. Uh, since the Dominion, of course, is, uh, is, is, there, is uh, there are those who argue that as an approach. I think in, in relation to the, I think the first thing, it's important to understand that, you know, more than half of those on benefits are actually in work, so the, the Skyvers and the Strivers narrative that uh, has been pushed is actually just factually wrong. Um, uh, so I think, you know, that, that needs to be challenged. The tax credit changes uh, are a big concern to us. We've done some work for our own members in calculating the, the differences there, and I know colleagues in, in Usdor representing another low-pay area in the retail sector have done some, some similar, similar work around that. And I think it's not well understood that, frankly, even if we got wages up, um, to you know, living wage level, we would still need the benefit system to kick in. And the reason for that is that it's about families. Um, you know, yes, if we get wages up, you know, single people in particular, those without families, that will probably solve the problem for them. But it doesn't solve the problem for families. We produced a paper with the Child Poverty Action Group um, a few months ago, um, which we talked about the working poor, and we explain this interaction between the two and I think that's very important. On the universal credit I think our concern is that yeah, in principle universal credit is a great idea and there are papers in in UK um, D, the equivalents of DWP that civil servants have written for government after government saying this would be a good idea in principle. The problem is the practical delivery of it. The computer systems to do this are absolutely horrendous and, and we've had some members who transferred out of local government into the fraud staff, for example, have gone from local government into the DWP. So I've seen some of this. It's not our organising area, but the first time I've seen some of it. And, you know, you really do have to wonder uh, if this is ever going to be doable in terms of delivering the massive complexity, particularly in areas like zero hours contract when wages go up and down and trying to get this to work on a computer system. I'm just simply, simply not convinced it's going to happen. And I'll add another one. The next problem is that, of course, they want to add housing benefits, take that away from local government, stick that into universal credit uh, whoa yeah your your uh, inboxes are going to be buzzing and local councils as well uh, with the complexity and the problems that that's going to create as well something that we feel the housing benefit because it's closely tied to the housing issues that local authorities that should stay out of universal credit and be and remain as a local government function thank you okay uh, thank you good morning a, a couple of comments to begin with first of all no one would disavow the the current better practices in the situation for employees is down to historically what the trade unions have achieved. And also, <clears throat> second comment is, I think, um, uh, as Unison says in their report, the Fair Work Convention has done or is doing a good job. But I want to go beyond that. I wonder if we uh, are really moving uh, with the times. When we talked about job quality this morning, if we relate that to wages and income, uh, I, I would suggest that there also has to be a significant change, not in, and I hate, sorry I used this earlier on, but a change of engagement and, and guidance, shall I put that in inverted commas, for the bad and the ugly, uh, but also the trade unions. Um, 
Wouldn't it be better if we had, at a local level, the, the, the German system where there is involvement of the employees in decision-making, in equity participation? And by the way, in the public sector, that can be done by having a, a process of committed costs. Uh, I'm wondering, I mean, do you think the trade unions have moved on sufficiently to secure the job quality involvement participation uh, of employees at the work level? Um, I, I'd, I'd show you my favourite infographic, which says, remind you that trade unions are the people who brought you the weekend and, uh, and, uh, and much else, much else besides. So, so I'll, 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 I will take as read my sales pitch for, for, these, for the wonders of the trade union movement. We've achieved a lot. We ain't perfect, but we have achieved a lot in those areas. And I think the evidence shows, even, even in the flexible work at labour market that the CBI and others would like to see, that the pile them high cheap approach, um, that we still achieve higher wages and better terms and conditions in unionised workplaces than we do in, in others, by some significant uh, uh, jump as well. I think your, your question, however, is, is, is legitimate. It's part, tied also to Patrick's point about what incentives can be there to, to create that. I think there are, there are very good models, and I think the, the Working Together report was, uh, was excellent in that it did... It's probably its greatest value was to pull out some of the best practice in, in Scotland on, on this issue. And, uh, you know, I know it's been the sort of almost personal drive Jim made this, made this for years uh, to, to pursue some of these issues. But I think he did enable us to pull out both in the public and the, and the private sector some of those examples. And I think if you look at, for example, I was seconded into the Scottish Government to implement the partnership agreement in the NHS. So I spent two years uh, at St Andrew's House um, introducing that, that system. Uh, and now it's been given uh, you know, ratings by, by academics in, in Nottingham University as probably the most ambitious example of worker engagement in Europe. And, and it's had real advantages. And some of the advantages, some of the managers, I have to say, at that time were very against it. They liked the traditional model. They decided. Then they chucked at us and we shouted back at them. And, you know, that's, that's the way it worked. The, the model whereby there's an early engagement in work design and not just about paying conditions, but the broader issues uh, in, ensures actually in many I can give you I could give you examples where Madge said Ashley Dave you're right we've made changes that we could not have made in the old system you'd have spent two years fighting them uh, but because you were engaged at the start um, the staff themselves were the ones who drove drove the change they were involved in design I can point to control rooms for example that have been designed by the workers not by somebody sitting in you know in a desk at uh, headquarters and they knew how to design it and they just got a bit of help to do it um, so I think there's that I think if we want to know how we'd stop some of that people say oh well trade unions don't and John McGurk mentioned it but remember that, for example that even in it difficult to organize areas statutory recognition only covers the basics only covers pay and wages bargaining it, it doesn't include an ability to bargain about training about about work organization all, all of the, all of the, all of those issues so I think the the way forward in the public sector to do that is um, is it's certainly the partnership approach and bringing that down to a local level as to how you would organize services in a particular area and free up up some more self-managed. Jim Mather would wax lyrical to you about an unpronounceable Dutch system, which uh, I can never pronounce. I won't even try. Um, not wouldn't poor reporters would never cope with my pronunciation. But essentially, it's about some element of self-management. And the Dutch model is different for a variety of reasons, but we could adapt uh, some of that to to a, a degree of, of self-management, which I think frees up the innovation that Chris. Warhurst talked about. So uh, in traditional management terms, you've got to sort out what are called the hygiene factors. In other words, you've got to get pay and conditions right. After that, you start to deal with the quality issues which ensure that you get that type of innovation. Now, you know, there are private sector examples of that. There are cooperative models, of course, uh, that work on that basis. But I do think that's an industrial relations model uh, which Scotland, because of its scale, could help to uh, develop, which might be more difficult elsewhere in the UK. Yeah, I think that's helpful. But the question is very simple, Dave. Was what is the role of the trade unions if we have more employee participation at the work level? I'm not disavowing the issue of you know sectoral bargaining or what have you. What do you see the role, given that things move on, and some people don't like to do that, and some people like to resist change, but change is a constant. So, what do you see the role of the trade unions being? and organising in terms of 
the work level particularly? Well, I think yeah. it's, sorry, Liz, come on, you go. No, I was just going to come in on that. Um, when I was sort of like, you know, looking at what is good work, what is bad work, and, you know, some of the stuff that's coming up was less autonomy, less control over the working day, and importantly, um, a little opportunity for a voice in the workplace. Now, um, I absolutely believe that we need to engage at a very local level with, you know, the trade unions and the workers. However, when you've got um, increasing um, reluctance to allow time off, with regards to facility time to engage with the workforce through um, your, your shop steward, your um, trade union rep, um, the facility time in a, across the, the private sector as well as our understanding the public sector is being diminished. Previously, when you had perhaps a, an agreement for, say, four hours, but with a wee bit of flexibility, flexibility is gone, you know, and it's now down. You've got your four hours and do not go beyond that. Um, where we used to have the opportunity for maybe four reps in a workplace, that's been been cut to two reps. You know, there's there's increasingly um, a move by employers um, or these ugly employers that Dave keeps referring to to um, to. These are all hanging my way, but just just to under to, to undermine, yeah. Question: right. Have you ever worked council, yeah. elected by people in the workplace, yeah. whether that's in the private or the public sector? where they negotiate free time or time off or the facilities that they work and they and they have a say in that. What is the role for the trade union at the at the workplace? Well it's what we what we do in those circumstances is we um, we we essentially provide support in terms of training for those people so they can you know just sticking somebody around a, a table doesn't ensure they can participate so a key role of there is training stewards and representatives to ensure that they can participate another one is ensuring that we uh, disseminate best practice uh, that we uh, which we do we identify briefings saying look this is working in in here let's carry that out that's carrying out there uh, those are the sort of practical things that, that trade unions do but of course they also provide the basic building block of basic protection so that you know if you're an individual stuck in a in a, in a non-unionized works council then you know you're you're not you're pretty reluctant to actually pitch in at that level and the thing about trade unions is that you know with the statutory and the the muscle of a trade union we don't have a problem chasing money or taking cases because we pay for those so we provide that basic basic level of support Support, particularly for the elderly employers, they might not be too keen. Well, can I just say, just, just so let me, if I may, you know, and, and I hope I fell into the category of the good, <laughs> uh, in terms of you know, employees had equity participation, they did not need somebody to teach them what to do around the table, they were, and they were engaged fully. When we went in, they were doing £1.4 million pounds revenue and losing £280,000 a year, with no pension fund. They now, with, with me not, <laughs> not being involved, are doing over five million pounds revenue. They're making four hundred and eighty thousand pounds profit, and the employees are certainly benefiting, both in terms of their long-term pension, and uh, say in the workplace. Well, I, and I could give you a whole string of other examples, which 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 would demonstrate where that added value has been provided. But I can also give you examples of where you know the the employers, particularly where there've been change of employers in some of those areas, where in fact those works council arrangements essentially have been collapsed or ignored because the new employer was one of Chris's uh, uh, worst one or your ugly ones. Yeah, so. Uh, about the bad and the ugly. I yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. fine. Okay. I agree. No, it was actually probably as Chick keeps reminding us, we've maybe not answered the question, but um, it was it was more to do with um, you know something that Unite was involved in in the workplace, and I don't know whether you would have picked up it in your workplace um, when you were there. But um, Unite organised mental health training um, for its reps and shop stewards, which the reps then took into the workplace. Um, the, that mental health training um, allowed. Um, workers to identify people who may need support, additional support. Mental health um, issues with regards to the stress, and precarious work is one of these areas where particularly it does cause a lot of stress and anxiety for people not knowing how much they're going to have from week to week, not knowing how many hours they're going to have from week to week, how they're going to put food on the table for their families. So these kind of stresses do create um, issues, psychological issues, which can lead to sickness, absence, etc. So Unite put in place a um, mental health training which allowed the reps in the workplace to identify people who perhaps needed support but also to guide employers to to, to be more supportive in that kind of environment rather than always say that's them off again 
um, to, to think about. So, you know, I don't know whether, you know, a, 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 a staff association or, a, you know, with regards to specific tr trade union things, we have got the, the ability with regards to um, the resources um, through things like the um, Union Learning Fund to put in place this kind of training that might not be taken up by other organisations. Okay, Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you, Vivian. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Professor Claire Bambra and NHS Scotland have talked in evidence about the positive impact that trade unions have on the health and well-being of our workforces. Um, and with regard to the Jim Mather report working together, the Scottish Government have uh, stated quite clearly that um, uh, trade unions are key uh, partners in the social and economic um, aspects of, of moving forward. In respect of those two things then, and we heard from the Fair Work Convention that they're in listening mode, what are you going to be taking to the Fair Work Convention? Um, obviously, we made submissions to the to the Working Together report, and we've identified a, a, n a number of areas. I think, um, obviously, the, from the Fair Work Convention's point of view, what we're looking for, I think, in the early stages, is that it's never to be a t slightly process driven uh, in terms of you know, getting some of the new processes in place, ensuring that, uh, for example, in the public sector, uh, that there are um, the essentially the NHS model is spread more spread more widely. So uh, it's about taking what's recognised as best practice and developing that more broadly so there's some what we're looking there for is some some encouragement in those areas um, we would hope the fair work convention for example um, would um, would essentially champion um, what what is best in the Scottish industrial relations culture as described in the working together report I think that's particularly important at the moment um, when the UK government essentially is trying to neuter trade unions through the through the trade union bill uh, and we we would hope that the fair work convention would be one of those mechanisms uh, by which um, the CIPD and others have identified they, they think it's a, an, out, an outmoded approach. So yourself as a partner. Absolutely. Uh, because yes, the, the, the Scottish Government are, are stating quite clearly that uh, you're very key in terms of that economic and social partnership. Uh, what I'm trying to get is obviously the Fair Work Convention is taking in, you know, uh, they're in listening mode at the moment because <laughs> it's process. You're absolutely right. Um, but I'm just trying to establish, do you see yourself as a partner? And if so, um, are you going to be reflecting on a lot of the positive aspects that, we, that we've heard from Professor Claire Bambra and NHS Scotland in terms of the, the impact that trade unions have on the workforce in terms of health and well-being? Absolutely. I mean, you know, we, we welcome the report. One of our uh, people are on the Fair Work, work our conveners, uh, a member of the Fair Work Convention. Uh, we see very much see ourselves as, as a partner in there. We bought into those processes in a range of industries and we see merit in developing that as a Scotland-wide area. Um, we included, for example, some of the evidence that Claire and others have put as, as examples of the things that we have done. Uh, and we'd like to see that best practice spread using the Fair Work Convention. That's fine. Thank you. Um, well, my comments were obviously um, we're very um, pleased and um, delighted to be involved in the Fair Work Convention, and our um, Deputy Regional Secretary sits on the Fair Work Convention. And one of the things we're looking to do is, is obviously um, again collective bargaining, looking at um, developing that, tightening that up, but also trying to strengthen some of the guidance. You know, you, you mentioned they're in listening mode, but you know it would be good to be in action mode as well because um, you know. Within Unite, we're kind of concerned about things like the guidance on blacklisting, where um, the guidance makes very, very um, straight claims about what it will not do. However, um, you know, our, ex our experience is that the guidance is, is, is actually, in many ways, ineffectual. Um, so it's about st strengthening these. It's ineffectual because... Um, despite the fact that we have got known blacklisting companies, um, I took a snapshot of contracts awarded from the date that the um, blacklisting guidance came into force in November 2013 to December 2014. And there was around 16 contracts issued to known blacklisting companies who have not taken remedial action. Um, and that 
the budget for those those particular procurement contracts was eight hundred million pounds. So despite you know guidance being there, we're looking to strengthen these because we can't say one thing and and be in listening mode if an action isn't we're not dealing with it in the action. So really, it's it's you know very much a partner, but equally a partner who's who's going to you know be a wee bit more forceful and. Um, time and they're saying they'll be coming out with a report they need to be in listening mode prior yeah. to the fact that they can move yeah. on take action on actually areas like you've suggested okay. thank you all right um gordon mcdonald i was wanting to ask you about the scottish business pledge uh, launched earlier this year by the scottish government and obviously there, there are a number of parts to that pledge which covers payment of living wage removal of exploited of zero hour contracts workforce engagement investing in youth, etc. And I was just wondering what your views were about the Scottish Business Pledge and do you think it's a useful tool? And we've talked a lot this morning about good and bad employers. Is it a useful tool in identifying good employers? And how do we encourage more employers to sign up to it? I think um, we, we welcome the business pledge. I think it's another example of, of spreading good practice. You know, if there was a silver bullet for this, then you know, I'm sure someone would have dreamt it up, and there isn't. So essentially what you've got to do is try and reach people in a number of different ways. The Scottish Living Wage Campaign, which I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm on the executive of that, we've been working for years using that model. Um, we see the business pledge as being complementary. It's not seeking that in every area but it's at least spreading good practice uh, and I think the the business pledge if it's got an advantage living wage is very narrowly about wages um, I've talked today about procurement about being wider than wages and I think the business pledge hopefully and the work of the fair work convention uh, will be about spreading those wider areas uh, for example um, uh, John McGurk this morning talked about zero hours contract. We have a disagreement with the CIPD. It's their analysis of, of, of zero hours contracts. Um, for example, in the care sector, if you look at the, the statistics, it said only 10% are on zero hours contracts because they say 80% are on permanent contracts. The trouble is, if you ask an employer, is someone on a permanent contract, if they've got a contract for 15 hours a week, but they're actually working 30 hours a week, they have a permanent contract. doesn't mean that they're on a, actually they're on a form of zero-hours contract. They're on a, what we call a notional-hours contract. It doesn't give you all the weakness, not all the weaknesses, but a lot of the weaknesses that Chris Warhurst described this morning are there. So zero, the, the use of zero-hour contracts and notional, nominal-hour contracts is actually more pervasive in Scotland than we think it is because the statistics are not showing that up. So what we want to do is to uh, use things like business, Business pledge, Fair Work Convention, and other initiatives to essentially spread by press and explain that you know quality jobs actually have a there's a business case for it. It's how we sold the living wage. You know, lots of employers came to the living wage who weren't convinced at the outset, but were convinced by the business case for it. I think where next stage is the business pledge and others is about making the business case for quality work in Scotland. Okay, Liz, so you want? Yeah, I'm. I'm agree with um, with Dave on that. Certainly I support the Scottish Business Pledge, although I um, have um, some doubts about its ability to um, really, really change the Scottish economy in any meaningful way. I think signing up to things never really works. I, I, the voluntary route for many things seems to be um, a route that leaves those those particularly ugly employers, as we keep talking about, um, off the hook. Um, I think, you know, I think, though, we have to have a multi-prong approach to some of this, and I think that, um, you know, we can't rule them out. I mean, I did put in my, my paper that um, we've got 332,720 small and medium-sized enterprises in Scotland, and I think to, to think that we're going to get them even a small proportion of that signed up to Scottish Business Pledge, um, you know, it would be would be difficult. People do sign up to things, um, you know, to, to get the, the kite mark, Um but we all can find ways around it. But certainly, uh, I don't think it, it's doing any harm. But, um, um, yeah. <laughs> Just on that point you, you made, you, you did say that in your, your um, written submission that you'd, yeah. you had 332,720 SMEs, yeah. but you also highlighted that they provide 1.1 million jobs, yeah. which is 3.3 jobs per employer. Mm -hmm. So is it a case of possibly these small enterprises think that things like the Scottish Business Pledge doesn't apply to them? 
or being registered with a living wage foundation doesn't apply to them, do you think it's maybe targeted at larger employers? I would probably, um, although I've, I've, you know, that, that those figures are, are very stark there when you mention them like that, you know, there's a number of very, very good small employers out there who's probably more paying more than the living mm, wage, yeah. paying, um, you know, treating their staff very well, yeah. very, you but, know, but very good terms point. and conditions. That's yeah, exactly my point. yeah, I, I, I get your point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, Sorry, Rob, do you want to come in? Yeah. yeah. Um, Just to to follow up on that, I mean, we were. One of the things I think um, we're most pleased to see about the business place was the the inclusion of, of around um, exploitative zero hours contracts. Um, as they said, they cause sort of massive problem for for our clients. Um, I think there's probably work that can be can be done and, and may that may need to be done by by the business pledge in terms of defining precisely what that is because it's not necessarily so much a problem with the with the contracts themselves and I think this is this is where sort of some of the learning comes in it's it's the way in which they've been used so if it's if it's been used to essentially deny deny employees their rights if it's been used to um, change the shift patterns or if, if it's a situation where they would prefer um, a more standard part-time or full-time contract then um, that's then then that would um, that would class as, as misuse. I think that there's probably other things that um, um, that could be added to it, but echo what um, what the other um, the other panelists have said that that it's it's welcome to it broadening out beyond beyond the living wage, which is which is also welcome and um, um, and hopefully sort of um, more more businesses will 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 sign up to it and um, and it'll it'll improve some standards. Okay. Very, very yeah. a, a statement of good intentions is always welcome, but does there need to be some conditionality around signing up to the business pledge that actually says we are going to, we promise to do this and we will be held to account for? It? I, I mean, I think I, I rather liked um, Chris Wallace's um, breakdown in terms of what you do for the different groups. You know, for, for the ugly, frankly, it has to be regulation and enforcement. And yeah, you know, I think Rob's made the point, and we made the point many, many times that you know, having having rights, having um, plaques on the wall is great. But if there's nobody going around checking, enforcing, uh, you know, we. Even now the living wage has taken off in a bigger way. We're finding far more cases now at the Living Wage Committee where you know people are challenging um, organisations that have signed up to, to the living wage. And then you know my staff say, see you know, adverts for jobs that are these companies <laughs> advertising jobs at less than the living wage, and people need to be challenged on that. And uh, and and that that is that is a problem for us. It's particularly the national minimum wage, in particular, it's a tiny unit in HMRC that. Are supposed to, to enforce the national minimum wage i mean really it is absolutely hopeless so for those groups i think you've got to have regulation enforcement i think for the 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 indifferent group as as chris was was putting it there i think that's where the business pledge and others come come in handy because what you know we can we can do we can pass lots of laws and uh, and the rest of it but what is important is about making cultural change uh, and i think what was noticeable to me that when we introduced partnership work and health services elsewhere you know yes I came along and said the government says you must do x but actually it took years before we changed trade union cultures as well which uh, Chickle like um, but in terms of it changes trade union because the biggest challenge a lot for a lot of shops you are suddenly these managers who they've been calling all the names under the sun for, for donkey's years suddenly they've got to get into teamwork and they've got to make decisions they've got to get into early decisions you know this you know they needed a lot of support and help to get through that as well and managers needed to change their cultural um, uh, approaches as well so you know things like the business pledge and others can help change behaviours in in the workplace um, but legislation underpins that drink driving all the smoking all of these things never cured the problem in themselves but they help to drive cultural change and i think pledges and others are helpful in doing that can i just follow up one point just on basis of what, what, what rob gowans just said about zero hours contracts i mean the business pledge does say businesses should not use exploitative zero hours contracts when scottish enterprise came to the committee i think two weeks ago and and we asked them you know, what is your definition of that term? They were unable to give us one, um, which rather begs the question, if, if, if the government's enterprise agency can't tell us what that term means, uh, how is somebody in business supposed to know 
can you offer any <laughs> any suggestions as what how you would define an exploitative zero hours contract? Sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, um, we had a, a go at it when um, when the term popped up in the public procurement uh, regulations. Um, we would suggest that where a worker would prefer a more secure part-time or full-time contract, if it causes hardship to individuals due to regularly changing patterns of work, if it denies individuals basic employee rights, if it acts as a deterrent to workers asserting their basic employment rights, um, and if an exclusivity clause is used, although this is now this has now been banned, um, and I think that 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 would certainly cover off a lot of the the issues that we that we see, um, without saying if, if if you want to you can zero as contracts, but don't use them in this way because that's misuse. There was a, there was a private members' bill in uh, Westminster which had made a similar mm -hmm. definition there and put in processes which were important for people to be able to challenge them. Uh, so I think those would all be helpful. But, but you think we need a definition? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, okay, yeah. Thank you. Okay, last, last brief point from yeah. Richard Lyon. In the last few seconds, and no one's asked you this question, uh, are employers nationally or locally better or worse employing people in the last day? than 20, 30, 40 years ago? I think that's very difficult to answer. I, I, I'd rather fall in, in, in Chris's point that, that we have a tendency to look with rose-tinted spectacles at, at what happened in, in years years gone by. Um, you know, as a trade union official of some 30-odd years standing, you know, I can I can tell you that it's, it's, it's certainly tough now, but it's been tough in the past as well. I think, well, there has been, and I think... Um, if you probably since the the early 80s when there's been a shift essentially from wages to profits uh, and um, there was obviously an ideology around this sort of stack it high approach we have seen some shifts there whereas I think there was a broader consensus after the war uh, more akin to what you know has been happening in Germany etc which obviously was developed for that purpose so I think that post-war consensus which was much more about uh, tripartism about partnership working about cooperation rather than conflict I think rather broke down in the 80s uh, and in the early 90s and I think we're starting to rediscover some of that uh, and, and and good for that as well but it'll take um, I think some time to get the culture um, not back because I don't want to go back to that method. I want a modern version of that essentially but I think it'll take some time for us to, to, to get back there so yeah I think there has been a cultural shift in the wrong direction uh, in the last 20-30 years um, but I think it is recoverable but it needs government employers and trade unions to work in partnership to get there okay thank you very much i think at that point with only two minutes over time i think we've done very well uh, can i thank on behalf of the committee uh, you all for coming along and helping the committee uh, with our evidence this morning we'll now have a very short suspension and go into private session thank you